on in, fellas. Special Service presents the Burns and Allen Show with Bill Goodwin, Felix Mills Orchestra, and the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Well, there's going to be a big show at the servicemen's canteen tonight, and Gracie is scheduled to play her concerto for index finger. <laughs> While waiting for George to take her to rehearsal, she's limbering up that talented digit. <laughs> You feel sorry for a Toby? Oh, yes. He's one of those unfortunate men who modern civilization has passed by. What do you mean? Well, there was my grandfather. He spent years learning to make candles. Along came electricity. Then there was old man Harris. Learned to make washboards. Along came the washing machine. And now, poor Jose Toby. What about him? Spent his whole life learning to play the piano with ten fingers. Along I come. <laughs> Nine fingers just left hanging there. Yeah, the poor man. Who else is going to entertain at the canteen tonight? Oh, there may be lots of stars from that picture I did. Uh, I did my concerto in Two Girls and a Sailor. I know Van Johnson will be there. Oh, is, um... Is, um... <laughs> Is, uh, is Van Johnson... Is Van Johnson popular with the soldiers? What did say, girl? I said, is Van Johnson popular with the soldiers? Oh, yes. You know how those soldiers love to dance. They... Uh, I don't... I don't get it. Well, Van Johnson has a big following of girls. Well, how does that make him popular with the soldiers? The girls follow him into the canteen and... And the, the soldiers, soldiers dance for them, I said. <laughs> He's quite a sensation with the girls, isn't he? Oh, George, it's unbelievable the way those young girls mob him. Why, they grab his handkerchief, pull his necktie off. Oh, say, uh, speaking of neckties, thanks for the one you gave me for my birthday. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I hope it looks as good on you as it did on Van Johnson. <laughs> don't tell me you've fallen for a sex appeal, too. Oh, don't worry, George. You're my man. Why, Van Johnson wouldn't have your sex appeal if he lived to be a hundred. You mean that? Certainly. I'll bet very few men of a hundred have your sex appeal. Oh, well, thanks, dear. Even men of ninety and ninety-five. Forget it, forget it. Even men of eighty-five. All right, all right. You're loaded with... Yeah, I'm loaded, I'm loaded. Uh, Um, Come in. Oh, hello, Gracie. Hello, George. Well, Tootsie Sagwell, where have you been all summer, Tootsie? Oh, during the army camp. Real entertaining? Oh, very. <laughs> Gracie means what did you do to entertain the boys? Oh, oh, I sold chances on a punch board. Uh, for prizes, I offered the boys weekend passes. Oh, I'll bet that got response. Well, it did at first. They thought I meant the kind of passes that let them out of camp. <laughs> Uh, we'd better get started for rehearsal, Gracie. Oh, all right. Uh, Tootsie, there's got to be a show at the canteen tonight. Uh, why don't you get a date and come down? Oh, who would I get a date with? Well, I'll run over the list of men who'll be at the canteen. Bill Goodwin, George Burns, Jimmy Durante, Van Johnson... Van Hose- Johnson? Oh, do you like him, Tootsie? Like him? Oh, Van Johnson. Oh, Frank Sinatra with muscles. <laughs> Say that settles it. I'll get you a date with Van Johnson. Now, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I absolutely forbid you to ask Van Johnson for a date with Tootsie. Is that clear? But, George... Well, promise me. Oh, all right. Oh, I want a date. Now, don't worry, Tootsie. I'll get you somebody. You don't care if it's a blind date, do you? Blind or sober? Get me a man. <laughs> Come on, Gracie. Let's go to rehearsal. <laughs> In plenty of time. Rehearsal hasn't even started yet. Say, I'm anxious to see this Van Johnson in person. Um, 
How does he, um, how does he look off the screen? Well, like Tootsie said, he's the Sinatra with muscles. He has the Sinatra appeal, but with a burned physique. Uh, Burns physique, eh? Yeah. You know how big and strong Bob Burns is. I know. Oh, look, there he is. Where? Just going into his dressing room. Oh, great me. Oh, hello, Van. Why did he come over and talk to oh, us? Oh, he's terribly bashful, George. He is? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, he's, he's a lot like you used to be. Was, uh, was I bashful? Well, you told me yourself that you were 27 years old before you found out what your weight strip. <laughs> yeah, I was shy. Well, Van Johnson is very shy, too. All the time we worked on that picture, Two Girls and a Sailor, he kept looking at me and wanted to come over and talk to me, but he just couldn't work up the nerve. And finally, the last day, he gritted his teeth, squared his shoulders, walked right up to me. Yeah. And handed me an apple. <laughs> you brought out the tiger in the boy. Yeah. Well, hello, Burns. Say, I'm sorry the rehearsal's late getting started. Hello, Bill. Hiya, Goodwin. Gracie was just telling me about Van Johnson. Van? Well, where is he? I've been looking for him. Well, he just went into his dressing room. You know, now that I've... <laughs> you know, now that I've seen him, I know why the girls go for him. Yeah? He's so innocent and boyish, he arouses the mother in them. <laughs> well, George, <laughs> I'm the same way. You... <laughs> You aroused the mother? Yep, aroused one last night. She came downstairs and made her daughter go to bed. I see. <laughs> well, I'll see you later, folks. I'm going in and talk to Van. Hello, Van. Oh, hello, Bill. <laughs> hey, listen, Van. Van, after the show tonight, why, why don't you get a date and let's go somewhere, huh? Oh, gosh, Bill, I can't get a date. <laughs> Are you kidding? Oh, I'm too bashful to ask a girl. Gee, there's one girl I sure would like to have a date with, though. She worked in that picture, Two Girls and a Sailor. Well, I never could get up enough nerve to speak to her. But finally, the last day... Yeah? I gave her an apple. Impetuous boy. She's, she's here now. I saw her just a minute ago and said hello to her. Well, why didn't you ask her for a date? Her father was with her. <laughs> Well, Van, why should that scare you? The man's only human. Mm, you haven't seen this man. <laughs> the girl's the girl's cute, huh? Oh, she's just the type I like. Yeah. Lots of fun. A million laughs. Cute as a bug's ear. Talented. Nice, too, Bill. She supports her father. <laughs> How do you know? Oh, every Saturday he used to pick her up at the studio and I'd see her hand him her check. Gee, this, this girl sounds like a real gem. What's her name? Oh, uh, no, I'm not telling you. You'll grab her. You wolf. Oh, why, Van, I'm not a wolf. How, how can you say that? Ah, uh, yes, you are. But, Don, I sure envy your technique with women, Bill. The way you can walk up to a perfectly strange woman and start a conversation. Conversation? Listen, Van, in two minutes, I can have her kissing me. Gee, how do you do it? Well, it's very simple, kid. I'll teach you. Oh, I don't know, Bill. I think I'll try to work out a technique of my own. Well, okay, Van, but whoever that girl is, you go find her and ask her for a date. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll keep an eye on her, and if her father leaves, I'll ask her. Well, that's a deal. I'll see you tonight. Well, it doesn't look like rehearsal is going to start for a while, Gracie. I'd better go on home. All right, George. I'll be home in plenty of time to get to the show. All right. Goodbye, baby. Goodbye, darling. Mm, let's see now. Who could I get for Tootsie's date? Jimmy Cash? No, no, he's seen Tootsie. Billy Smills? No, Tootsie's seen him. Uh, hello. Oh, hello, Van. Uh, how's your father? My father? Well, he's fine. How's yours? Fine. Hot, isn't it? Yes. Uh, read any good books lately? No. H have you? No. <laughs> I don't know how to talk to you. I'd like to have a date tonight, but I haven't got the nerve to ask for one. A date? Well, maybe that can be arranged. Gee, 
You mean you oh, was... Oh, sure, I was trying to think of someone for a date when you walked up. Oh, boy. I'll be by your house at 7.30. Thanks a lot. Bye. Oh, goodbye. Oh, my goodness. Well, I'd better tell Chuck to be at my house. Oh, I forgot something. What? Uh, here's another apple. Oh! <laughs> Jimmy Cash, our popular young tenor, sings for you the old favorite, After You've Gone. Dance. After you've gone and left me crying, after you've gone, there's no denying, you'll feel blue, you'll feel sad, you'll miss the dearest pal you ever had. There'll come a time, now don't forget it There'll come a time when you'll regret it Someday when you grow lonely Your heart will break like mine and you'll want me only After you've gone, after you've gone Van Johnson is just arriving at the Burns home to take Gracie to the canteen show. Still under the impression that he has a date with her and that George is Gracie's father. Oh, hello, Van. Hello. Is Gracie ready? Oh, uh, are you going to take us to the canteen? Us? Are you going? Sure. I'll bet it'll be great tonight. Oh, not as great as I thought. <laughs> What's the matter, kid? You, uh, you feel low? Yeah. Girl trouble? Well, not so much the girl. It's, uh, it's her father. He's always hanging around. Oh, one of those guys who follows his daughter around like a bloodhound, huh? Yeah, except this one's more like a Pekingese. <laughs> well, don't let this old budget spoil your romance. You can't get rid of him. Just ignore him. Grab the girl in your arms and hug her and kiss her. Right in front of the old man? Certainly. <laughs> Let me know what happens. <laughs> You'll be the first to know. Good. But maybe this girl doesn't smooch. A smooch? Yeah, you know. That's when a fellow and a girl... Uh, oh, I guess in your day they called it bundling. Yeah, but don't let that worry you. Just grab her and kiss her. Believe me, she'll love it. I think maybe she will at that. She looks awfully love-starved. <laughs> By the way, who is the girl? Well, it's Gracie. Gracie? Gracie who? Gracie Allen. Oh, you're a lucky fella. She's a very... <laughs> Gracie Allen? Yes, sir. Oh, you young wolf, get out of my house. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's all right to smooch other girls, but when it comes to your daughter... Daughter? Why, you... Don't get excited, Pop. I'm going... Pop! Gracie! Gracie, come in here. Yes, dear? Do you know that Van Johnson has got a crush on you? A crush on me? Yes. Oh, that's ridiculous. Why, I'm old enough to be his sister. <laughs> Well, just the same is true. And not only that, but he thinks I'm your father. Oh, well, now, George, no one could possibly think that you're my father. But my father has brown hair and yours has a little gray in it. Well, I'm going right over and tell him I'm your husband. Oh, no, wait, George. A shock like that might be too much for him. What shock? I'll just walk in and say, Gracie and I are married. He'll get over it. Oh, I don't know. Remember how long it took to bring my mother to? <laughs> Well, he's got to be straightened out, shock or no shock. Oh, dear, now why did this have to happen to me with all those beautiful young single girls at MGM? Why did he have to fall for a beautiful young married girl? Look, Gracie, I'm going over and tell him. Oh, but George, he's so young and innocent. To save his pride, let me disillusion him gradually. <laughs> then he'll think he's giving me up. That might take years. Hey, it might. Nothing for that. I'm going over and tell Van Johnson we're married and right now. 
Oh, my goodness. Now, if George gets to him first, it might warp his whole life. i better call him and get him right over here. Come in. Hello, Gracie. Oh, Tusky, am I glad you're here. I'm in terrible trouble. What's the matter, Gracie? Well, Van Johnson is in love with me, but I'm married to George, so I've got to get rid of him. Well... Well, George shouldn't be so hard to get rid of. <laughs> oh, no, I don't want to get rid of George. I want to get rid of Van Johnson. Do you feel all right, Gracie? <laughs> well, certainly. Well, well, just tell him you're married to George. Oh, Tootsie, the shock might be too much for him. Why, his freckles might turn gray overnight. <laughs> <laughs> there he is now. You go in the den, Tootsie, and I'll make him think I'm not the kind of a woman for a sweet, innocent boy. I'll disillusion him. Make him give me up. Oh, Gracie, don't make him give up women entirely. That would be a terrible waste of manpower. Well, here I am. Is it safe for me to come in? Well, that all depends, sucker. <laughs> huh? Lots of men have found I wasn't a safe type. That's why they call me Golding and Gracie. Uh, you're only kidding. You think so, huh? Got a dime. A dime? That's right, a tenth of a dollar. Oh, oh, sure. Here you are. See, I'm just after your money, sucker. Well, you're not after very much. I didn't want to scare off the new prospect. Oh, the big stuff comes later. Mm, that's your life, sucker. <laughs> Men have paid me a million dollars for a smile. A billion dollars to hold my hand. How much for a kiss? I've never been kissed. Nobody can afford it. <laughs> no, sonny boy. Oh, Run not along. me. I'm staying. Don't be a sucker. Get moving, Van. <laughs> but I happen to like you. I'm not the sort of a girl for you. All I care about is diamonds and pearls and Kleenex. <laughs> I'm not happy unless I'm covered with more mink than a mink. <laughs> Crazy, you're wonderful. What's so funny, sucker? It's the best hard-boiled act I've ever heard. An act? What? You don't believe me, huh? Oh, no. Oh, well, excuse me, there's someone at the door. Hey, Gracie, they're waiting for you at the canteen. It's almost time for your concerto. Oh, Bill, I'm in a mess. Van Johnson is here and he's in love with me. In love with you? Yeah. How about George? No, he just loved me. <laughs> no, no, Gracie. I mean, does he know about George? No, he thinks George is my father. Your father? Oh, Gracie. <laughs> Confidentially, is he? <laughs> oh, Bill. Now, look, you've got to help me disillusion Van. Make him think I'm the wrong kind of a girl. Hey, what's going on? Oh, hello, Bill. Tell him, Bill. Tell him what I am. Cat the dog. <laughs> the canteen just called your lady. Oh, dear. We're on our way. <laughs> you handsome man. Hello, Bill. Goodbye, Tootsie. Uh, hello, Mr. Johnson. Goodbye, Tootsie. Oh. <laughs> Gee, won't I ever get a break? Come on, Bill. They're waiting at the canteen. <laughs> And now, fellas, we present that distinguished pianist composer, Gracie Allen, who will play her original composition, Concerto for Index Finger. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, boys. And before I play, I'd just like to pay tribute to the man who made this possible, my piano teacher, One Finger Louie. <laughs> Mr. Felix Mills will conduct the orchestra. I'm ready, Mr. Mill. <laughs>
wonderful, Gracie. Shall we go on our date now? Oh, Van, aren't you disillusioned about me yet? Oh, no, I don't believe all that silly stuff you pull. Tell them the truth, Gracie. Oh, well, all right. Van, George Burns is not my father. He's my husband. <laughs> That's the funniest one yet, George. Well, he is. <laughs> I can show you our wedding license. We're absolutely married. Oh! <laughs> Gracie, you're a scream. Well, what's so <laughs> unbelievable about that, George Burns? Happens to be a very handsome man. Here, George, stand up here beside Ben Johnson. I, I, I just want to compare you two. Okay. <laughs> well, that's it. Now, let me look at you side by side. Well, Gracie? George, are you still were married? <laughs> George and Grace will be right back. George and Gracie, and their guest, Van Johnson. Oh, I'm sorry I got things so mixed up tonight, Mr. Burns. Oh, that's all right, Van. And I'm sorry I laughed when Gracie said you were a husband. Yeah, you shouldn't have done that, Van. I know. <laughs> There's nothing to laugh about. <laughs> <laughs> there certainly isn't. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I should say not. <laughs> okay, okay, break it up. Good night, <laughs>
This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. Inviting all you servicemen and women to enjoy another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen, our tenor Jimmy Cash, and Felix Mills and his orchestra. And now, meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Well, it seems that the latest fad among the housewives of America is to attend the auctions of second-hand furniture and antiques, which are being held in just about every town. Gracie and her neighbor, Mrs. Morton, are no exception. A dollar twenty is bid. How about a dollar twenty-five? A dollar thirty. The little lady bids a dollar thirty. How about a dollar thirty-five? A dollar forty. The little lady says a dollar forty. How about a dollar forty-five? A dollar fifty. A dollar fifty. How about a dollar fifty-five? A dollar sixty. Sold to the lady for a dollar sixty. Gracie, why do you keep digging? Oh, Blanche, that man on the platform doesn't scare me just because he's got a hammer in his hand. <laughs> I've outbid him every time. Dollar sixty for the coffee grinder wasn't bad, but you certainly paid a big price for that bedspread. Yeah, that was a mistake. You see, I bought that for a Tipsy Sagwell. I thought at last I was getting her a handsome man. By getting her a bedspread? Well, when the man said with pups, how did I know he didn't mean sunny? <laughs> Pardon me, ladies. The articles you bought this afternoon come to exactly $40. Oh, good grief. I didn't know we bought that much. I'm almost broke, Gracie. And me, too. Uh, Mr. Auctioneer, just send us the bill the first of the month. Oh, sorry. This is a cash fee. Can't pay. You sit in a bit. Can't pay? My good man, have you a blank check on the southeast branch of the Northwest Canadian Farmers and Merchants Banking and Trust Company? Yes. Yeah. You have? <laughs> Blanche, that I'll hold your things until 7 o'clock. If you aren't here with the money, they'll be sold. Bye, sir. Oh, see, we don't want to lose those wonderful antiques. Guess there's only one thing to do, Blanche. You ask your husband for 20 and I'll ask my husband for 20. All right. But let's face it, Gracie, getting $20 out of our husbands is going to be like pulling their teeth. Yeah. Well, come along, Dr. Cowan. <laughs> Coming, Dr. Beecham. The car's in the garage, Brad. George is home. So is Harry. You think George will give you the $20, Gracie? Oh, yeah, I've got a system that never fails. Harry. I tell him how sweet he is, handsome, and smart. That's the system I use on Harry. And then if that fails, I flood him with a bowl. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I've never laid a bowl on George. Uh, except to cut his hair. Well, just so you get the 20. I'll check with you later. Hello, honey. But, Johnny, what are you doing here? Johnny? Oh, it's you, George. I thought you were Johnny Weissmuller. <laughs> really? Well, yeah. Of course, now that my eyes are used to this light, I see where you're still in the state. You're a much younger man. Oh, I'm not so much younger than Weissmuller. <laughs> Am I? <laughs> Well, right now, you look like 20 to me. I do? Yeah, and you have a much better figure than Wise Collar, too. He thinks he's so much going around pounding on his chest. Now, your chest looks like it's really been pounded. <laughs> 
<laughs> You're my big, strong, handsome, generous ape man. Mercy, whenever you flatter me like this, you usually wind up asking for money. Really? Do you usually give it to me? <laughs> yes. You're my big. All right, all right, all right. That's enough. Is that twenty dollars worth already? What do you want twenty dollars for? Well, I thought. Don't tell me you want to buy some more of those stupid antiques you've been lugging home from those docks. Don't tell you that, huh? <laughs> well, because I wouldn't give you a penny. Look at this house. Turns, umbrella stand, coffee grinder, bed post. All of which I make into useful articles of furniture, Jared. Now, yesterday I brought home an old brass coffee pot and made it into a table lamp. Well, what became of the table lamp we had? I made that into a tea kettle. Well, what happened to our tea kettle? I made that into a flower pot. And the flower pot? That's now a dying little radio. What's become of the little radio we had? Well, I ought to have something to boil water in. <laughs> Why didn't you use the table lamp? Oh, George, now you're being silly. Yes, I'm very silly. What antiques did you buy today? Oh, something you'll be needing, dear. A baby thing. A baby thing? The... Now, of all the silly things. A baby thing? <laughs> you mean you're... We're going to have some use for a baby thing? We certainly are, darling. But it's too honey. Sit down. <laughs> uh, when when do you expect to start eating this baby thing? Just as soon as I can make it into a coffee table. <laughs> Nuts. That's all we need yet. An antique baby bed made into an antique coffee table. Come in. I don't want that piece of junk around the house. Oh, oh, excuse me. Did I step into the middle of a family tiff? Oh, hello, Bill. I'm trying to convince my wife that it's silly to keep a useless old broken down antique around the house and she ought to get rid of it. But George, where'd you go? <laughs> You're a scream, Willie. I'm going up there. Oh, Bill, now you've made them mad, and I never will get the 20 I need. Uh, unless, uh, maybe I borrowed it from you? Well, sure, Gracie, I can let you have 20. Oh, you're asking. Oh, I'm glad to do it. I sure 20's enough. You can have 40 if you want it. <laughs> well, Bill, will you lend me the $20? George wouldn't give me a cent. Well, gee, Gracie, I, I really haven't got it. Besides, if George doesn't give you any money, you can't pay it back. Can't pay it back? My good man, have you a blank check on the southeast branch of the Northwest Canadian Farmers and Merchants Banking and Trust Company? Yes. I must find a new bank. <laughs> Jimmy Cash, our young tenor, sings to you the romantic ballad, It Could Happen to You. Hide your heart from signs of your dreams at night. It could happen to you. Don't have stars or you might stumble. Oh, 
God, Boo, Bill, can't you think of some way I can get $20 from George? Well, why don't you wait till he goes to sleep and take the money out of his bill for? Oh, no, he'd wake up. Oh, not if you were real quiet. Oh, yes, he would. I'd have to turn him on his back to get to the inside pocket of his nightgown. <laughs> Jakey, you mean he sleeps on that little round tummy of his? Oh, yes. You see, his feet and his head kind of balanced, and with just a little start, he can rock himself to sleep. <laughs> Let's get pretty seasick in an earthquake. Yeah. Well, you see, Bill, the trouble is that I don't dare tell George what the $20 is for. If he finds out it's the paper and he'll have a fit. Here he comes downstairs. Jakey, I'll see you a little later. I'm going to run down to the cigar store. Oh, oh George, before you go, uh, can I have that $20? What's it for? Uh, two tens would be all right. Oh, four five. What's it for? Oh, you can give me five fours. <laughs> What's the $20 for? Oh, three sixes and a two. Gracie, I'm not giving you any money until you tell me what you want it for. You're not? No. Uh, well, so long, dear. So long. Oh, wait a minute, George. There wouldn't be any men in this world. Just women and children.
Oh, hey, you know, some I think the postman's got a crush on you, Grace. Oh, oh, he doesn't mean anything. He's got... Oh, here comes Blanche up the wall. Maybe your husband gave her enough money for both of us. Oh, uh, come in, Blanche. Did Harry give you the money? No, I couldn't get a cent out of my old goat of a husband. Yeah, well, I couldn't get any out of mine either. Hello, Miss Morton. Oh, hello, Bill. Bill, I'll bet when you get married, your wife won't have this trouble. You're darn right she won't. My wife's going to have everything. Two or three cars, jewelry, fur coats, expensive clothes, and more money than she can possibly spend. Gee, when are you going to get married? Just as soon as I find a girl who's got all that. <laughs> well, Gracie, what are we going to do? We haven't got the money there by 7 o'clock. That auctioneer will sell everything. Yeah, I know. And that's that wonderful antique. That big, beautiful chest with Napoleon picture on it. Mm. And that bust of Shakespeare. And that great big figure of Percy. Yeah. Oh, I especially wanted that to put in our bedroom. Uh, and then, when George is away on a business trip or something, and I'm lonesome for him, I could just look at that figure of Hercules, and it would remind me of our honeymoon. Did you? Yes. The man who owned the hotel where we stayed was built just like that. <laughs> oh, Gracie, why do our husbands have to be such tightwads? Yeah. You, you'd never know George is the same man who wrote me those passionate love letters. George wrote passionate love letters uh, before we were married. I took them right here in this desk drawer. So, now, listen to this, Dad. Dear Funny Bunny. <laughs> funny Bunny. Well, he has lots of things to be funny bunny. He's a thing lollipop pie. Do tell me more. Well, no, the other ones were just silly. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, there is funny bunny. Tonight, as I think of you, my heart beats like a dynamo in my bosom. I am all a single with the electricity of love. <laughs> well, Frank, what do you think of that? Wonderful. Too bad he had a short circuit later on. <laughs> oh, no, that is smart. Until I heard from you today, there was no sunshine in my life. I was on the verge of leaving my hotel and wandering through the streets, but your sweet letter came in time. Thanks for the 20 bucks. Now I recognize the style. Well, you know something, Grant? I ought to leave this letter around so George could see it. That would remind him how sweet he used to be. I see an idea. Where would he be sure to see? Mm, well, let's see now. When he comes home after a hard day at the office, he usually makes a beeline for the ride. He does? Yes. So I'll leave it in the bread box. <laughs> I think i just leave it here on the table, Gracie. Yes. Yeah. Oh, all right, Dad. Um... Oh, Gracie. Hey, Gracie. I guess you did. There's probably a note for me here on the table. Wait a minute. This envelope is addressed to Gracie. Here is funny, funny. Dynamo in my person? Electricity of love? Thanks for the 25th. Holy smoke. So that's what she wanted, the $20. Gracie, it's got a gigolo. <laughs> Time for Felix Mills and George. Here, Kentucky.
Well, George found a love letter addressed to Gracie asking her for money. Now, he doesn't remember that he wrote it himself about ten years ago, so he thinks Gracie is being pursued by a gigolo. Meanwhile, Gracie is on the telephone having her own troubles with the auctioneer. But I'm trying to get that $20 for you, Mr. Auctioneer. No, no, please don't call my husband for it. My goodness, if he knew I bought all those answers, he'd be furious. Gracie. Oh, I'll have to hang up now. I hear my husband coming. Goodbye. Gracie. I found out who you wanted that $20 for. He did it? Yeah. Well, he wants it right away. He just telephoned me. <laughs> Gracie, why give that man money? What if he got that I haven't got? Oh, George, you should see that big, beautiful chest with Napoleon's picture on it. <laughs> he, he let you see his chest? Well, I, I even pounded on it to see how strong it was. Gracie, you didn't. Well, sure, lots of women did, even Mrs. Martin. There are other women who see him? Why, George, you can't get near his place. It's mobbed with women. They bid against each other. <laughs> this guy must be the new Van Johnson. Gracie, what made you start a thing like this? Well, George, it's your fault. My fault? You told me to find myself a hobby. <laughs> Well, that's a fine hobby. Well, would you rather have me play bridge like the other women? I certainly would. Oh, George, you just said it. Oh, why don't you come along with me tonight? You'd enjoy it. Me? Well, certainly. He's got the bust of Shakespeare, and he's got the figure of Hercules, and he's I don't got... want to hear anymore. I'll see you later. Oh, my goodness. Never saw a man so dead set against Dante. Well, I, I still got to get that $20 somehow. Come in. Hello again, Mrs. Burns. I was so excited when I was here before, I forgot to give you your name. Oh, Mr. Postman, am I glad to see you. Have you got $20? Why, yes. Oh, would you lend it to me? Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Burns, but my wife gave me this $20 to buy you a suit this afternoon. If I come home without a suit, she'll have a tizzy. Oh, I see. If I have a tizzy. How would you like to buy one of Mr. Burns' suits? Oh, I could never buy the kind of suit Mr. Burns wears. My wife wouldn't let me spend that kind of money. She wouldn't? Oh, no. She makes me spend at least $18 for a suit. Well, just take a look at my husband's things. They're right here in this hall closet. Now, here's a beautiful pair of lounging pajamas. Oh, they are nice. I just love those flowers on them. And I'm afraid the pants wouldn't fit me. Oh, nonsense. You just gather them up in the back and you'll have a beautiful bouquet to sit on. <laughs> well... Oh, and here's a handsome sports jacket, Mr. Postman. Why don't you slip it on? All right, I will. Oh, my goodness, this doesn't fit me at all. Feels awfully lumpy in the back. Well, no wonder. Your mailbag is underneath it. <laughs> Move the bag around to the front and it'll fit you just like a desk George. I'll take it. Oh, good. And how about this nice double vest? What's that? Take me out. Why, George, what are you doing hiding behind those bushes? Shh. I'm waiting for something. Why, you little rascal, is it you? <laughs> Gigolo was trying to take Gracie away from me. And I'm watching the house to see who it is. No fool. Well, has anybody gone in? Nobody but the postman so far. Oh, the postman. Oh, well, there's nothing to worry. Wait a minute. Postman? George, he's the guy. Now, Bill. It's true. I overheard him talking to Gracie this morning. And he was given out with a big romantic line. The postman? Yes, Bill, don't be ridiculous. What could Gracie see in that scrawny, broken-down little runt? And maybe she likes your type. Just the postman. Bill, how could you think that a little sort of... Hey, he's carrying my suit. And my shoes. And my sports jacket. Why, oh, he's even got my shaving mirror. Oh, George, you're looking at the pants of your blue serge suit. <laughs> oh, the postman is the gigolo. Gracie couldn't get the money for him. So she's giving him my clothes instead. Why, I'll break every... Bill, hand me a club. Oh, never mind. Hey, 
Mr. Poulton, come here. Come, Mr. Burns. Put up your fist, you little gigolo. Oh, help, Mrs. Burns. Mrs. Burns. George, what are you... Why, George Burns, the idea of picking on that little postman. You let go of him this minute so he can get up off your chest. Okay, but I caught you. So he's the gigolo who wanted the, who wanted the $20 for. Gigolo? What gigolo? I wanted the $20 to pay the auctioneer for the antiques I bought today. <laughs> what's the, what's the point? The postman, my gigolo. <laughs> the idea of you thinking I'd have a postal copy popper. <laughs> okay. But who wrote you this love letter? Who did? Why, George, you wrote this to me. I did? Well, certainly. I saved every one of your love letters, darling. Really? Well, sure. It's the only record I have of how much you owe me. Come well, let's go in the house. <laughs> George and Grace will be back in a second. Forces Radio Sir. Jimmy Cash, and Felix Mills and his orchestra. And now, meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Sit down, George. Mrs. Regan will have breakfast ready in a minute. Swell. Wasn't it wonderful of Mother to send it to us? She was with our family for 20 years, you know. Yeah, I know. Mm, and her husband took every cent she made. If I were a man, I might stoop to lots of things, but may lightning strike me if I'd ever take money from a woman. Yeah, me too. <laughs> what's, uh, what's the weather forecast? Uh, clear. Yeah, me too. 
Isn't Mrs. Reagan a wonderful cook? She makes such delicious Irish dishes. Mm. But I'm getting a little tired of chowder all the time. Well, George, I thought you liked chowder. I do, but not in the morning with my Wheaties. <laughs> well, I, I spoke to her about that, dear. There'll be no more Wheaties than chowder. Good. This morning she's going to serve you grape nuts and chowder. <laughs> well, that's better, Anne. Yeah. Well, good morning, folks. Are you ready for your breakfast? Well, of course you are. Everybody's ready for breakfast at this hour of the morning. And I know you folks are no different than anybody else. You aren't, are you? No. (laughs) No, but, Mrs. Reagan, this morning I want my breakfast without chowder. You mean you don't like my chowder? Oh, don't pay any attention to him, Mrs. Reagan. You make the most delicious chowder in the world. Oh, it isn't that good. Yes, it is, Mrs. Reagan. I'll go on with you. Really? <laughs> I don't believe it. Well, now that I think of it, Father didn't care much for it. <laughs> Your father didn't like any liquid that he couldn't blow the foam off of. <laughs> How about breakfast, Mrs. Reagan, without chowder? All right. Oh, Gracie, darling, remember how Joel Muldoon used to love my chowder? Joel Muldoon? Oh, one of my old boyfriends, George. He wanted to marry me. Yes. And wouldn't I like to be cooking chowder for him this morning? Ah, well, to the will of the world, what's done is done. I'll get your breakfast. Gracie, uh, who is this Joel Muldoon? Oh, I hardly remember him. The moment you came into my life, I simply forgot all my old boyfriends. Building Joe? Yeah, I don't remember a thing about him. He he was six feet two inches tall and had a 48 chest. (laughs) Dimple in his chin and a freckle on the left side of his nose, and he wore a size 7 hat and a size 38 suit. I hardly remember. Oh, yes, hardly, hardly. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, oh, wait a minute. That wasn't Joe. That was Ernie Marky. Joe was. Never mind, never mind. Well, here's your coffee, folks. There's nothing like starting off the day with a good cup of coffee. Don't you feel that way about it? You do, don't you? Yes. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Reagan, I was just telling George about Joe. Ah, wasn't he the clever lad? He was so handy. Do you remember the time he fixed your mother's vacuum cleaner? Oh, yes. <laughs> I remember once our vacuum cleaner was broken and George tried to fix it. And what happened? <laughs> well, he put the motor in backwards, and instead of drawing in dirt, it blew off his pants. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. You can stop it. I'm not interested in hearing what a handyman Joe Muldoon was. Oh, Mr. Burns, don't take on like that. Sure, you've no need to worry, and no cause to be jealous of Gracie. There was just the one man who ever meant anything to her. Oh, really? Yes. And Joe's married now and has children. <laughs> so there's no need to worry. I'm going upstairs. Oh, Mrs. Regan, I think we've heard his feelings. That sweet man. I wouldn't harm a hair on his chest if he ever grows one. <laughs> you really love the little Lugan, don't you? No, I wouldn't trade him for any of my old boyfriends. Just name one of them who was more handsome or more intelligent than my George. Danny O'Shea, Jimmy Carter, Matthew Scanlon, Willie Hearn, Johnny Keo. I said name one. <laughs> oh, I'll get it, Mrs. Regan. You finish in the kitchen. Oh, hello, Bill. Oh, well, hiya, Gracie. Where's the little man? Oh, I think he's upstairs pouting. Bill, I'm afraid I stepped on his toes. Well, Gracie, with those feet of his, how can you help it? Oh, no, Bill. I think I offended him without meaning to. You know George. He might do something foolish. Well, you mean... Yeah, something desperate. There were only something around the house that needed fixing. Oh, I know. I'll loosen that bolt that holds the sink up. <laughs> and Mrs. Reagan... What is it, Gracie? I think I know how to snap George out of the mood he's in. Hand me the wrench. Gracie, darling, you're not going to lower the boom on him, are you? Oh, no, no. I'm just going to loosen this big bolt under the kitchen sink. There. Oh, George, come here, darling. Now, 
I'll ask George to fix it, and if you think he's a handy man. I see. And he won't be jealous of Joe Muldoon. Well, he shouldn't be. Joe's a professional plumber. Did you call me, Grace? Oh, yes, darling. There's something wrong with the kitchen sink. Would you mind fixing it? I thought I wasn't good at that sort of thing. Oh, George, I was kidding. You're very clever. Well... Here, take this wrench. Well... Oh, you're so clever. How did you know which end of the wrench to hold? I know a little about it. Oh, I, I think it's that big bowl, George. The one that looks a little loose. Oh, you mean this one here? Oh, you're so clever, darling. You knew which bowl it was, even if that after I stopped pointing at it. Well, I think all I have to do is give this bowl a little twist. Oh, I just don't know what you're talking about when you use those mechanical terms. <laughs> Step back, Gracie, while I tighten it. But, George, don't you think you ought to turn it to the right? Gracie, are you going to tell me how to fix this thing? Oh, no, dear, no. Well, I'll just give it one more turn. But, George... There. See, it's all fixed. I see. Here's a lovely song. We predict you'll be hearing it a lot. Jimmy Cash sings for the first time on the air... Pretty soon. You'll be wanting again pretty soon to the tune of home sweet home. We'll be dreaming again pretty soon neath the moon where sweet The same arms that held you will hold you once more. We'll be walking again pretty soon to the truth of home, sweet home. Turn on that faucet. 
Hmm. Now turn on the gas. <laughs> oh, well, leave it that way, honey. When you want to take a nice hot shower, just crawl in the oven. <laughs> Uh, hand me the wrench. Of course, Mrs. Regan might be a little surprised when she turns on the faucet to wash vegetables. <laughs> oh, so that would be the first time anyone here ever gave radishes gas. <laughs> hand me the wrench. Hmm. I'll just loosen this connection. Uh, but, George, if you loosen that, won't the sink fall again? Honey, are you going to tell me how to work? Stand back. Uh. Here, let me turn it off. Well, Judge, maybe I'd better call a plumber. No, sir. If Joe can fix things, I can fix things. Oh, dear, don't be jealous of Joe. Just remember there are lots of things that you can do that he can't do. Really? Certainly. For example, you can... Uh, you can... Uh, and, uh, well, anyway, don't be jealous. <laughs> Hand me the wrench. Oh, excuse me, dear. There's someone at the door. Good morning, Mrs. Burns. Well, good morning, Mr. Postman. How are you today? Tip top, Mrs. Burns. Simply magnificent. When I fill my lungs in this fresh air, it just makes me want to cry out with ecstasy. Well, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh. <laughs> Oh, what makes you feel so frisky this morning? There's a nip in the air. No, I mean the air. What's that? Oh, that's my husband trying to prove that he's a handy man around the house. Well, what for? Oh, well, it's a long story. You see, he's used to working with his head instead of his hand. His head has a nice ring to it. <laughs> So, Mr. Postman, you know how to fix the kitchen sink. Oh, sure. Well, look, would you do this for me? Go in there and fix it for him, but don't let him know that I sent you, and then he'll call me in and tell me he fixed it and everything will be fine. Certainly, Mrs. Burns. Oh, thank you. It's pretty heavy. Do you think you can handle it? Oh, I'm as strong as an ox. I can lift it with one little jerk. <laughs> well, he'll be glad to help you, but don't call him that. <laughs> Oh, and just one thing, Mr. Postman. Leave one little bolt loose so he can tighten up in front of me. <laughs> we wanted to look convincing. All right, Mrs. Burry. Oh, Gracie. Gracie. Yes, dear? Well, she's all fixed. Oh, George, you're just the cleverest man I ever married. Uh... It was nothing. I just have to tighten this one bolt here. Ugh. Uh, George, shouldn't it turn the other way? Honey, are you going to tell me how to fix the sink? One more turn. Ugh. I, uh, I gotta get a larger wrench. Oh, there's someone at the door. Now, wait till I get back, or you may turn it wrong again. Oh, I can't make the same mistake three times. My IQ hasn't dropped that low. Ah, oh, dear. Hi, Gracie. Oh, hello, Bill. Come in. What was that? George just dropped his IQ. <laughs> That's a pretty heavy IQ the little man has got. Well, he's trying to repair the sink. How come? Jealousy. I bragged about an old boyfriend of mine, a plumber, being handy at fixing things. Well, that roused a little green-eyed monster. Yeah, well, it sounds like the little monster needs help. I'll go out and give him a hand. Oh, would you, Bill? And, and don't let on that I know you're helping. I want him to have the credit. Gracie, you know, you sure pamper that clumsy little man. Well, George is a brain worker. He has a broad mind. You see, Bill, you develop whatever you work with. The farmer uses his hands, so he's broad hands. Postman is on his feet all day, so he has broad feet. George sits at the desk all day. <laughs> that didn't come out right, did it? It did for my dough. 
<laughs> well, I'll go out and fix the steak for George. Oh, thanks, Joe. And, oh, I'll leave just one little thing for him to fix so he can show off in front of me. Okay, Gracie. <laughs> Yes, dear? Uh, she's all fixed, baby. Oh, George, you're wonderful. My mother used to call you that dope who can't fix things. Oh, she'll have to change now. Yeah. We'll have to call you that dope who can fix things. <laughs> See, all I have to do is just tighten this bolt one turn. Oh, let me do it, George. Honey, I can do this with my eyes closed. Watch. Uh. Well, I'll be darned. It didn't fall. Sure. Uh. Oh, you can open your eyes now, George. Time now for Felix Mills, the orchestra, ever popular for me and my gal. <laughs> think we ought to call a plumber? No, sir. I'm going to convince you that I can fix things just as good as Joe Muldoon. Oh, I'm convinced. Why, when the radio was broken, you got it fixed with one finger. I did? Certainly. You got on the phone and dialed the repairman. <laughs> well, it's finished. Oh, well, sweetheart, haven't you got those pipes mixed up? Of course not. Turn on the faucet. All right, dear. There. What? What happened? The lights went on in the living room. <laughs> That's funny. I'll switch this pipe here. There you are. Now turn on the faucet. All right. It's all right now, dear. Good. Lights went off again. <laughs> well, I'll be done. Say, here's a loose wire. Maybe if I connect that... It straightens things out. Hmm. There you are. Now turn on the faucet. All right, dear. What's that? That's the phone ringing. Well, answer it. Hello. Who is it, dear? It's you, George. You're talking in the pipe. <laughs> oh, fine. Hang up. Hey, what goes on in this house? Why? What's the matter, Bill? Well, I went to turn on the radio in the living room and Gabriel Heater squirted water all over me. <laughs> and now 
our friends, here's Jimmy Cash. Tonight, Jimmy sings for you the popular favorite, Time Waits for No One. Jim. Time waits for no one. It passes you by. It rolls on forever like the clouds in the sky. Time waits for no one. Goes on in the sea. It's just like a river. Precious moment we miss will never ever return again. So don't let us throw one sweet moment away. Time waits for no one. Let's take love while we may. You'll find that love is like this. Precious moment we miss will never ever return again. Don't let us throw one sweet moment away. I'm waiting for no one. Let's take love. before your man drowns us all entirely. Oh, but Mrs. Regan, you can't get a plumber for love no money these days. Sure you can get Joe Muldoon. Joe Muldoon? You mean he has a plumbing shop here in town now? That he has, and you'd better get him quick. Oh, dear, if I get Joe Muldoon, George will go storing out of the house. If I don't get him, he'll go floating out. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> Pardon me, is this Joe Muldoon's plumbing shop? Madam, please. This is the house of Muldoon, piping by appointment. <laughs> well, I'd, um, I'd like to see Mr. Muldoon. Have you made previous applications? No, no, I'm an old friend. I just dropped in. <laughs> Madam, you are refreshing. Perhaps I can get you on the waiting list. Name, please. Mrs. George Burns, but if you just How many tell... bathtubs have you in your home? Oh, we have two. Good, we you... like to keep out the riffraff. <laughs> now tell me, what's wrong with your tub? Well, he just can't fix the sink. <laughs> and what is the nature of our sink trouble? Well, I don't know exactly. It just came apart in my husband's hands and squirted. <laughs> mm-hmm. Can we diagnose that as severe faucet prolapse? Well, I guess we can if we want to. <laughs> and we do want to, don't we? Those statements ready, Mr. Gibney. They're not quite, Mr. Baldwin. Oh, Joe, Joe, it's me, Gracie Allen. Well, bless my heart, so it is. Come into my office. Oh, thank please. you, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what brings you here, Gracie? My husband. He's a wonderful man, but so clumsy. He is? Oh, awesome. We almost didn't get married because of it. When the when the justice of the peace asked him for the two dollars, he could hardly get my pocketbook open to pay him. Well, what can I do? Well, come over to my house and fix my sink. Okay, but I've got an emergency call first. Some jerk has got his sink torn up, and he wants it fixed before his wife gets home. Well, I'll leave my address with the man outside, and you come over as soon as you can. Okay, Gracie. <laughs> All right, buddy, your sink's fixed. Gee, I'm glad Goodwin sent you over. What do I owe you? I'll be fair about it. How much money you got in your wallet? About 15 bucks. I'll hold it while you go for more. <laughs> oh, sh- see here. Have oh, you... George, George, where are you? Oh, it's my wife. Don't ask questions. When 
she comes in, tell her you're the milkman. In the kitchen, dear. Milkman? That's right. I want my wife to think I fix the sink. Well, how are you getting along with... Oh! Well, I'll be This dark, is the so milkman, th- dear. He's been watching me fix the sink. Nice job, huh? Well, well, so this well, is... Well, goodbye, Mr. Milkman. You can leave an extra gallon of whipping cream tomorrow. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, I want not... a dozen pounds of butter. Goodbye, Mr. Milkman. Hey, wait! Make it two dozen. Goodbye! Well, honey, the sink is as good as new. Stuff like that is a cinch for me. Well, of course it is, sweetheart. <laughs> what do you need with a plumber when you've got me around? Yeah. I'll bet I'm 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 twice as handy as that guy Joe you're always bragging about. Ah, you cute. <laughs> the romantic ballad is back in favor. Sweet and lovely. <laughs> get Bagley to sell that lot. I tried to close the deal yesterday. I even gave him one of my cigars. 
but I guess I was over-anxious. He smelled something fishy. Now, you shouldn't have taken the cellophane off. <laughs> well, I'll keep working on Bagley. Well, good morning, folks. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Reagan. Uh, this is my day off, Mrs. Burns, but I thought I'd get Mr. Burns his breakfast before I go. Swell, Mrs. Reagan. I'll have some bacon and eggs. Ah, uh, fine choice. And sure, there's no one in this whole world can fix bacon like I can. It's fair and mess in your mouth. It's tender and crisp and crunchy and delicious. Good, good, and good, good. Well, I'll have some. Oh, there's not a speck in the house. <laughs> but I just smelled some frying. And that you did. But before I had a chance to bring it into you, it had disappeared into the blue. Disappeared? That's ridiculous. Would I be telling you a lie, sir? No. Which is the soul of honor I am. Sooner than tell a lie, I would go without lace curtains on my windows. Now, that's right, dear. Mrs. Reagan never tells the fib. Uh, look, I'll prove it. Uh, Mrs. Reagan, am I pretty? Oh, that you are. Am I talented? Yes, indeed. Am I smart? Oh, smart to the whip. Am I the prettiest, most talented, smartest girl in the whole world? No. <laughs> I should have quit when I was ahead. <laughs> well, anyway, she doesn't lie, George. There's no bacon. Would you like a nice scrambled egg, Mr. Burns? Well, of course you would. But there's nothing so nourishing as a nice scrambled egg. Okay, just bring me the scrambled egg, Mrs. Yes, Reagan. Yes, I will. Sounds funny about that bacon disappearing. Yeah, well, never mind, sweetheart. In our post-war home, we'll have a machine where you just press a button and bacon comes out. Great idea. But what could they, uh, uh, what could they make a machine like that out of? Pig iron? <laughs> yeah, pig iron. And we'll have a copper one, too, if we want a copper coffee. You're making a joke, huh? Well, sort of, yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Burns? Yes, Mrs. Regan. Would you like a nice waffle for your breakfast? Oh, of course you would. But there's nothing so nourishing as a nice waffle. But what about my scrambled egg? Well, uh, I, I had some eggs, but they, they disappeared into the blue. Oh. So now the eggs have disappeared into the blue. Do you, do, do you expect me to believe that? Remember, dear, she never tells a fib. Huh. Oh, so doubtful, huh? Mrs. Reagan, am I pretty? That you are. Am I talented? Oh, yeah, you are talented. Yes, uh, am I smart? Oh, smart as a whip. <laughs> this time I know when to stop. <laughs> all right, Mrs. Reagan, just bring in the waffle. Yes, sir. Hmm. What's all this disappearance? What's going on oh, around now, here? Oh, please, Judge, don't be upset. Uh, let's talk about our new home. Oh, gee, moving into a new home will be like a second honeymoon, won't it? Yeah. Well, that's what I like about you, George. You're a, a romantic husband. You still dream about our first honeymoon. I do? Oh, yes. You know, just this morning I walked into the bedroom and you were lying there with your little rosebud mouth open. Uh, how could you tell I was dreaming about our honeymoon? You were making a noise just like Niagara Falls. <laughs> what we'd better concentrate on is getting that lot from Joe Bagley. Oh, Mr. Burns. Uh, what now, Mrs. Regan? Uh, wouldn't you like a nice cup of chowder for your breakfast? Uh, of course you would. Well, there's, there's nothing, nothing so nourishing. Never breakfast. mind, never mind. The waffle is going to... Yes, sir. Disappeared into the blue? Yes, sir. Well, uh, that does it. This time, I don't believe it. You don't, eh? No. <laughs> then it's proof I'm forced to give to a person who would doubt the word of a Regan. Tell me, Mr. Burns. What is the color of a police officer's uniform? Blue. Well, the bacon, eggs, and waffle disappeared inside Officer O'Toole. <laughs> so that's it. You're feeding a cop out in the kitchen. Oh, yeah. now, Judge, you should be proud to have Officer O'Toole eat your food. He's a celebrity. He is? Oh, yes. Remember last year when six bandits who robbed the National Bank were captured in a gun battle? Yeah. One of them was his cousin. <laughs> Some celebrity. Um, uh, what are 
were you and Officer going to do today, Mrs. Reagan? Well, we were going for a bit of a ride in the park, Mrs. Burns. Oh, how sweet. I suppose you'll sit under some nice shady tree and spoon a little, huh? Oh, no. We couldn't do a thing like that. Well, why not? Faith, and who'd hold his horse? <laughs> Better forget my breakfast, Mrs. Reagan, and run along with your policeman. Oh, and Mrs. Reagan. Yes? Uh, be sure to take the waste kitchen fat to the butcher shop. You know, the government needs waste kitchen fat now more than ever before. You bet I will, Mrs. Byrne. Well, we're back where we started. How do we get that lot from Bagley? Yeah. Come in. Well, hi, folks. Say, what's the matter? You look worried. Well, Bill, Joe Bagley owns the only vacant lot in this neighborhood. And we want to buy it from him to build our post-war home on. Yes, Bill. It'll be one of those plastic houses with all the latest inventions. There'll be a gadget that does the laundry, sweeps the floor, dusts the furniture, and all for a few cents a month. Well, that's certainly cheaper than the gadgets you got doing it now. He cost you a fortune. <laughs> Uh, look, comedian. Uh, Bill, I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't poke fun of George. I happen to think he's wonderful. And from now on, if you can't say nice things about him, just don't say anything. Oh, gosh, Gracie, I was only kidding. I love George. I, I think he's the sweetest little old man in the world. <laughs> That's better. Gee, I love every wrinkle in his darling little face. <laughs> now you're talking. I love every hollow in his precious little chest. I love every All right, day, all huh? right. Stop loving me. <laughs> Bill, if you love me so much, help me get that lot of Joe Bagley's. If I can only... Oh, I'll answer him. Well, well, well. My little five-year-old sweetheart. Hello, Susan. Good morning, Mrs. Burns. Good morning, Mr. Burns. Oh, good morning, Susan. Come in. Uh, well, I'll be running along. See you later, dream girl. All right, dream man. Uh, dream man? Oh, didn't you know? Mr. Goodwin and I are going to be married. You are? Yes. We haven't set the day yet, but it will be sometime in 1960. Won't he be a, a little old for you by then? Oh, no. Mr. Goodwin says he won't get any older. He takes vitamins. <laughs> He takes vitamins. <laughs> yeah, that keeps him from getting older. Yeah. Well, George, don't stand there. Run after Bill and find out what they are. <laughs> Never mind. Sit down, Susan. Thank you. Oh, George, I just had a wonderful idea. Now, we want to get in good with Mr. B-A-G-L-E-Y. And here sits his N-I-E-C-E, so let's be real G double O D twice. I get it. And she'll tell B A G L E Y and he'll sell us the L O T for our H O U S E. Right. Oh, using me to put over a real estate deal, huh? S M A R T, isn't she? Uh, Susan, would you like a nice big cookie? I'll say I would. Why did I say that? I haven't got any cookies. Oh, great. I want a cookie. I want a cookie. Oh, fine, and here comes Joe Bagley up the walk. He'll think we've been beating her. Uh, here, Susan, here's a nickel. Run out the back way to the store and get some cookies. For a nickel? There's a war on, you know. <laughs> all right, all right, here's a dime. Now scoot. Mm, that's Joe Bagley. Now look, Gracie. Let's not make a fuss over him. Let's not be over anxious. Yeah, I get it. Act like we don't care whether he sells us a lot or not. That's the idea. Be nonchalant. Well, just leave it to me, Judge. Good morning, Gracie. Oh, yeah, hit the road. Gracie! <laughs> Was I nonchalant enough? Here, let me at the door. <laughs> Well, hello, Joe. What do you know? I know I almost got my nose cut off in that door. Is my little niece Susan here? Oh, yes. That is no. I mean, she'll be back. She's a lovely little child, Joe. Oh, yes. George and I would like to keep her here for the day. Well, I guess that would be all right. You like kids, huh? Oh, yes. We get a lot out of kids. Oh, we're certainly planning to get a lot out of this one. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> well, thanks, Joe. We'll send her home this evening. Goodbye. Gracie, that was a great idea. We'll treat the kids swell, and Bagley will love us for it. Yes. We'll give her everything she wants. Uh, what do little girls like? Oh, um, let's see now. <laughs> if I could only remember what I liked when I was five years old. <laughs> Funny how ten or eleven years will appeal one time. <laughs> Gracie, I married you ten years ago. How could I have married you if you were six years old? You'd have to be a hillbilly. What'd you say, Clem? Oh, stop. <laughs> Time for Felix Mills and his orchestra. You made me love you. I didn't want to do it. You made me love you. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. You make me want you. And all the time you do it, I guess you always knew it. You made me happy sometimes. You made me glad. But there were times, dear, you made me feel so bad. Oh, you made me cry for. I didn't want to tell you. I didn't want to tell you. I want some love that's true. Yes, I do. Indeed, I do. You know I do. Give me, give me, give me, give me what I cry for. You know you got the brand of kisses that I cry for. You know you made me love you. George and Gracie have their hearts set on Joe Bagley's vacant lot as the location for their post-war home. But Joe doesn't want to sell, so they're taking care of his little niece, hoping to influence him. Ah, uh, Judge, isn't Susan a darling child? Yeah, she's a bright little thing. Oh, yeah, what an imagination. A little while ago, I found her in the bathroom playing gardener. Playing gardener, huh? Yes. Your camel's hair coat was the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. And the lawnmower was your electric razor. Oh, no, no. I, I caught it just as she was mowing the back terrace. Gosh, with winter coming on, how much camel's hair did she, did she mow? Well, where you need it most on a windy day, it's just camel. <laughs> the murder. How does a five-year-old think of things like that? Oh, she didn't think of it. Oh, was... it was your idea. Oh, uh, well, uh, George, I've been trying to get rid of that old moth-eaten trap ever since we've been married. Moth trap? Honey, that's a very expensive coat. I bought that when we were in Vaudeville, remember? Wore it morning, noon, and night. Wouldn't take it off. You couldn't take it off. You hocked your suit to buy it. <laughs> Well, I don't mind the coat so much, but she ruined my electric razor. I'm going in and taking it away from her. Oh, no, wait, George. She's just a child. You must learn how to handle children. Now, calm down. I, um, I've got some news for you. You're going to have one of your own. What? Uh -huh. A brand new one. It'll be all yours. But, gee, honey. 
When when will it be? Just as soon as they start making electric razors again. <laughs> Look, let's send Susan home. But, George, she's our only chance to get Joe Bagley's lock. Well, that's right. We'll have to be nice to her. Oh, Gracie, I'm hungry. Oh, all right, Susan. Uh, what would you like? Well, I should have some spinach. Spinach? Okay, Susan. I'll run down to the store and get you some spinach. Here's your spinach, Susan. But I can't eat just spinach. I should have some carrots, too. Carrots, too. Okay. I'll be right back. Uh, there you are, Susan. Carrots. <gasps> Oh, but I should have vitamin D homogenized milk, too. Vitamin D <laughs> homogenized milk, huh? Okay. Well, here you are, Susan. Spinach, carrots, and milk. Now, eat it. No. I wouldn't eat that. But you told me that's what you should have. Yes, that's what I should have. But I never eat it because I don't like it. <laughs> now, Susan. I'm hungry. I'll go, George. Hi, Grace. Oh, Bill, maybe you can help us. How do you get a girl to eat? Well, I wouldn't know. <laughs> My problem's always been getting them to stop. <laughs> Gracie, why is it every time I take a dame out, all she wants to do is eat? Well, Bill, I guess she feels safer with a knife in her hand. <laughs> why, Grace. But I'm talking about the Bagley's niece, little Susan. Come in and see if you can help. Oh, come on, Susan. Eat the nice carrots. I don't want to. Well, but Susan, they give you curly hair. Carrots put the curls in my hair. Oh, really, Bill? You mean at night you put your hair up on carrots? <laughs> Why won't you eat, Susan? Mommy always makes me some nice hot oatmeal. Oh. Well, all right, Susan. I'll go out and make you some oatmeal. Bill, I have to answer the door. Why don't you take Susan on your lap and tell her a story? Okay, George. Well, jump up on my lap, Susie. That's it. Now, put your head on my shoulder. There. Now, uh, how would you like to be in pictures? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> That's the story I give the older girl. <laughs> Bill, tell her the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Okay, George. Well, Susie, once upon a time, there was a little girl. Here's your mail, Mrs. Bur oh, it's Mr. Burns. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Postman. Say, do you have any children? Oh, yes. I have two daughters, Frances and Chevrolet. Chevrolet? She just arrived this year. You named her Chevrolet? Yes. What we really wanted was a car. <laughs> ever have trouble getting them to eat? I used to. I spanked Frances until my hand was red, but she wouldn't eat. Then I bought a book on child psychology. And that did it? Yes. When I spanked her with that, she ate. <laughs> well, I couldn't spank the little girl I'm taking care of. She's Joe Bagley's niece, and I'm trying to buy a lot from him. Well, I'll be running along. So long, George. Oh, so long, Mr. Postman. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Well, goodbye, Mr. Burns. Remember, keep smiling. <laughs> Jimmy Cash, our young tenor, sings to you the romantic ballad, It Could Happen to You. Sing it, Jimmy. Hide your heart from sight of your dreams. At night, it could happen to you. Don't count stars, or you might stumble. So 
good girl and eat your oatmeal. Uh-uh. I don't want to. Well, George will eat some to show you how good it is. But I don't like oatmeal. George. <laughs> All right. Mmm. Yummy yum. Oatmeal is delicious. Is it really? Mmm. Mm. Do you like it? Yes. <laughs> then you eat it. <laughs> now, come on, Susan. Eat your food like a good little girl. George, you take another spoonful to show her how good it is. Now, one more spoonful. Open your little mouth. There. All gone. You ate everything on the table, George. <laughs> you can open your eyes and let go of your nose now. <laughs> well, Susan, that shows you how delicious the cat... Hey... Where's Susan? Well, she's in the kitchen eating your steak. <laughs> My steak? Well, that's only fair. You ate her carrots. Now, look, I'm not going to let her... Remember, she's Joe's niece, and Joe owns the lot you want to buy. But she's got my steak, and I'm loaded up with carrots. Carrots are good for you, George. I hate carrots. <laughs> my father says they're wonderful for night blindness. Well, he ought to know. He's blind every night. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we've made Susan happy. I gave her your billfold to play with. Well, good. Anything to keep her out of trouble. And, Gracie, I've cut out all the paper dolls. Paper dolls? Yes. I cut out pictures of Washington and Lincoln and Hamilton. Where'd you get them, honey? Aren't those green pieces of paper in your billfold? Oh, no. <laughs> if I didn't want that lot of Joe Bagley's, yeah, I would... George. George. Uh, come on, Susan. And Gracie will undress you and, and put you to bed for your nap. Now, uh... Oh, what's this in your pocket? That's a note my Uncle Joe gave me this morning. <laughs> I forgot to give it to you. What does it say, Gracie? It says, uh, Dear George, I am sending this note by Susan to tell you that the lot you wanted was sold yesterday. No! <laughs> no! Kentucky, where the sky is blue and the grass. 
that is true. When the sun is star, the welcome and smile is made to order for you. There is somebody waiting to begin celebrating in Kentucky. I'm not denying that my heart will be flying when I get to Kentucky. I'll declare it's heaven with all those wonders in store. Oh, Lord, make me lucky when I get to Kentucky. Let me stay there forevermore. set on that post-war home. Oh, honey, I'd be happy anywhere with you. Well, I'd live in a cave with you. A shack. I wouldn't care if you pitched a tent on an empty lot. Really, honey? Sure, as long as it was Joe Bagley's lot. Oh, fine. <laughs> all you servicemen and women to enjoy another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen, our tenor Jimmy Cash, and Felix Mills and his orchestra. And now, meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. 
Oh, um, uh, Mrs. Regan, yes? I just remembered something. I'm completely broke. Could you pass... I'd be glad to lend you some, Makushla, but I'm in the same fix myself. I sent the last penny I had to my brother so he could get himself some glasses. Oh, how sweet. Yes. The poor fellow got tired of drinking out of bottles. <laughs> Don't get some money, neither one of us will get the hat. Oh, if only Mr. Byrne were, weren't so tight, sisters. Oh, Mrs. Regan, George is a big spender. When we were in Broadville together, we used to pool our salaries. And many of the weeks, he spent so much money on me that we got clear down to his salary. <laughs> then why not ask him for money to buy the hat? I did. But he wouldn't give it to me because I've already overspent my budget. Oh, why, why don't you try a bit of blind? You mean... Flatter the little rat? Sure. <laughs> Flattery will work on any red-blooded man. It might even work on your husband. <laughs> well, Mrs. Regan, that's a wonderful idea. I, I, I'll get the money. If... Here he comes down the stairs. Good morning, Mrs. Regan. Good morning, Gracie. George! George, don't move. Huh? Stand there and let me look at you. Oh! You're so incredibly handsome. I am? Oh, if only I were a sculptor. Let the others make statues of Apollo and Mercury and Hercules. You're the man I want to chisel. <laughs> oh, Gracie, I didn't... Oh, how do they ever pack so much man into one body? When I stop and realize that you're mine, all mine, it just frightens me. Oh, honey. Ah, how how did great big gorgeous attractive you ever come to marry itty bitty gorgeous attractive me? Look, great. Oh, come on, hot lips. Tell me you love me. I love you. Oh, no. Now, uh, put some feeling into it. I love you. Uh, do you really, darling? Yes. That's good. Um, um, George. No, you can't have the hat. <laughs> but George. Flatter flattery will get you no place. Flattery, I was telling the truth, wasn't I, Mrs. Regan? That she was, Mr. Burns. You're a man with the shimmering beauty of Killarney in your face. And the twinkle of the stars over the emerald isle in your eyes. And your voice, oh, your voice is like the sound of the wind blowing through the shamrocks. And, uh, oh, no, no, I can't do it, Gracie, I can't do it. It would finish me in Ireland. <laughs> I thought so. So it was flattery and Mrs. Regan was in on it. But, John... Look, honey, you don't have to flatter me to get things. I don't? Of course not. When you want something, just come right out and ask me. That's the way to get it. All right. George, can I have a new hat? No. <laughs> I like the other way better. I thought I was getting someplace. No hat. No huh? hat, no. <laughs> George, why, do you want to, why don't you want to buy me a new hat? Of course, you always get such ridiculous, outlandish hats. I do not. You do, too. What would you say if I came home with a derby that had a flagpole sticking through the crown and two toy jeeps racing around the brim? George, that sounds darling. Where did you see? Oh, stop. <laughs> Jimmy Cash, our young tenor, sings for you the romantic ballad, The Day After Forever. Jimmy? All day tomorrow, I'll be whispering your name, and the day after forever, I know.
my favorite song. All through a lifetime, I'll be loving you. what I did, and I want to apologize. What did you do? Oh, I deliberately slathered you to try to get a new hat. I feel stupid as saying to myself. Oh, don't feel stupid. Oh, it was a low, mean, vulgar thing to do. Oh, honey. I hate myself for such sneaking, underhanded, vile trickery. I didn't mind. I'll tell you something. It almost worked. One more compliment, and I'd have given in. You're incredibly handsome, All John. right. <laughs> Uh, that's no way to get things. Ah, you're right, George. Flattery never works. Now, let's say, for an example, that I wanted to ask you to let me use the car this morning. Don't waste your breath. The last time you had the car, you got a ticket for parking in front of a fireplace. Parking? That policeman ought to be ashamed. All I did was stop for a wave, and he gave me a ticket. That does seem unfair. Where did you stop for the wave? At my regular beauty shop. <laughs> Forget about the car. Oh, well, I'm not asking for it. But if I were asking for it, I'd forget flattery and just appeal to your intelligence. Right. Because you're too clever for flattery. Certainly. The way to appeal to a busy, brainy man like you is to just ask for the car honestly, and you'll say, well, sure, Grace, you take it. Absolutely. Oh, thank you, John. Now, wait a minute. Now, 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 now you promised. Look, honey, I don't mind you taking the car when it's necessary, but you're not a good driver. Harry Morton next door says you ruined his elm tree backing out of the driveway. Oh, that's a man for you, exaggerating. I ran over one teensy tiny little branch clear at the top of the tree. <laughs> How could you run over a branch at the top of the tree? The tree was lying across our driveway. Well, didn't you see it? Well, how could I? It wasn't lying there until I hit it. <laughs> Look, honey, I'm going to let you use the car this morning because I denied you the new hat. But try and... and... By the way, uh, what do you want the car for? Well, I want to buy some bananas and some cherries and avocados and some vegetables and maybe a pheasant. Well, that sounds like essential marketing. Sure, and I'll eat the money. Okay, here you are. And now, honey, drive carefully. Keep your hands on the wheel, your foot on the brake, your mouth closed, your ears open, and your eyes on the road. 
Is it all right if my nose just hangs there and rests? <laughs> Never mind being flipped. Just see that you have the car back here by noon without a scratch on it. All right, dear. Well, I guess that's finished our shopping, Mrs. Regan. I parked the car right over here. Oh, tell me, Gracie, darling. How did you ever manage to get the car and money, too? Oh, I told George I wanted to buy bananas and cherries and avocados and vegetables and the pheasants. But uh, you didn't buy those things. I bought everything but the pheasants. <laughs> Couldn't find a hat with a pheasant on it. <laughs> sure, I'd hate to be married to you, Kushler. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it would be much fun for me either, Mrs. Reagan. <laughs> oh, well, here's our car. <laughs> Oh, will George be surprised to see us home without a scratch on the car? Did you see that? That parked car ran right into it. <laughs> Gracie, darling, you, you backed into it, and your bench, your back fender, it looks like a pretzel. Hello, Mrs. Byrne. Are you having trouble? Oh, hello, Mr. Postman. You girls seem to be on a bender. <laughs> I made a little joke. <laughs> well, I guess you're not in the mood for levity. Well, I'm afraid not, Mr. Postman. Uh, do you think there's much damage done? Well, your rear bumper is out of shape, if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> Did I, I, I hurt the other car? A little, but don't worry about it. I know the old biddy who owns it. She's a sourpuss. Oh, but I should pay for any damage. Oh, no, don't pay a penny to the old battle axe. Let, let her ask her husband for the money. Well, all right. Who does the car belong to? My wife. <laughs> My Mrs. Burns. Well, Gracie, I backed the car into the garage for you. Oh, thank you, Bill. Anything to keep George from seeing that back fender. Yeah, you, you really folded it up all right. Well, this has taught me a lesson, Bill. I hereby solemnly swear that I will never lie or deceive my husband again as long as I live. Unless I'm positive it'll work. <laughs> hey, here comes George up the walk now. Uh-oh. And... He's here for the car. Well, well, calm down, Gracie. Maybe I can square this whole thing for you. I have a little idea. Say, Gracie, who backed the car into the garage? Why, um, I did, didn't I, Bill? Sure. Really? I didn't know you were that good. Oh, yes. I back into lots of things that you don't know about. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're improving. I'm going to drive down to the office now. Goodbye, dear. Oh, go Goodbye. Oh, Bill, what if he sees the family? Leave everything to me, Gracie. Wait a minute, George. Uh, say, George, you mind dropping me at Hollywood and Vine? I, I gotta pick up a cute little girl there at 3 o'clock. Bill, I don't go to Hollywood and Vine. I go to Wilshire and La Brea. Oh. Well, okay, I'll pick one up there at 3 o'clock. <laughs> running right into the side of the garage. Back up. Huh? Come on, back up, back up. Okay. More, George, more. Come on. Father. Oh! You smacked the whole back end of the car. <laughs> what? I barely cut Oh, the... come on. Let's get out and look at the damage. Oh, murder, George. Look what you've done. Gee, I can't believe it. Fender is folded up like an accordion. Gracie will never let me live this down. You're not kidding. Bill, is there maybe some way that you could make Gracie believe that she did this? 
<laughs> what? You want me to stoop to deceit and trickery? <laughs> well, I... You want me to make someone who didn't do this believe they did? Well, I... I'm surprised at you, George. Well, forget it. Forget Shame it. on you. I won't do all it. All right, all right. You dirty person. All right, I am. Think I ask you to do it. I'm the only one who knows. I'm the only one who could tell her. <laughs> and you wouldn't tell her, would you, Bill? <laughs> would you, Bill? <laughs> Bill, look at me. Bill, old pal. Um, George, and I've been thinking, maybe we should make a few changes in your radio program. Look, Bill, I'm not going to let you or anybody else take over my program. I've worked hard to get where I am. I struggled, I starved, but I finally made it. I achieved success. You married Gracie? Yes, I do. <laughs> no. Well, now, uh, what if I tell her about Defender, huh? Well, I'm going to tell her myself. If she loves me, she'll forgive me. I'm going right in now and confess everything. <laughs> I've been watching the garage through the kitchen window. Your husband didn't leave. He's heading for the house right now. Uh-oh. Maybe he saw the fender I smashed. Oh, I'm in for it if he did. Now, remember, Mrs. Byrne, you're a lady and you're Irish. So don't degrade yourself by arguing. Just bash him with a bottle. <laughs> Call me if you need me. Hmm, the best thing for me to do is just confess everything. If he loves me, he'll forgive me. Uh... Tracy, uh, I'd like uh, George, to... George, before you say anything, um, don't you think that oh, when married people do something that other married people don't like, married people should forgive married people, uh, especially if they're married? <laughs> uh, we are married, aren't we, George? Well, yes, but I'm glad you feel that way, Gracie, because... I've got a little confession to make. Well, so have I, but you go first. Oh, no, no. Ladies first. Oh, no, that doesn't count. You go first in this house because you're the boss. I am? Well, you are when it fits in with what I'm saying. (laughs) 
Well, I'll make my confession, then you make your confession. Ah. I smashed the fender on the car. Well, now for mine. I smashed... <laughs> you what? I backed up and smashed the fender. Oh. Oh. oh, you did, huh? Yeah, and now I feel better because I've confessed and you'll forgive me. Huh? <laughs> huh? <laughs> I don't, I don't like the sound of that. I do. <laughs> forgive you indeed. Imagine refusing to let me drive the car and then going out on a wild joyride. But I only... Going uh... through traffic at 80 miles an hour. But all Knocking I... Knocking down widows and orphans. Okay, okay, you've got me over a barrel. Uh-uh, I've got you over a hat box. Hat box? That's right. Remember the hat you said I couldn't get? Yeah. Well, I'm keeping it. <laughs> Oh, so you already had it. Now she did. Dashing it. through red lights, bumping into Greyhound buses. Okay, keep the hat. Sure, and I'll get a dress to match it. Okay. Gloves to match the dress. Aren't you carrying this a little? Waving at blondes. Throwing empty bottles in the street. Get the gloves, get the gloves. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. And a bag to match them. Smashing the car so badly that even months wouldn't buy it. <laughs> I didn't say anything. No, I just threw that in for the shoes I'm getting to match the bag. Oh. Well, answer the door, Barney Oldfield. Yes, dear. Well, hurry up, Los Angeles driver. Yes, dear. Good afternoon, Mr. Burns. Here's your mail. Thanks, Mr. Postman. My goodness, you sound low. Having trouble with your wife? Yes. Oh, me too. Women are beasts, aren't they? <laughs> but we men are so gullible. Along comes a pretty face and we're hooked. Yep. Come to think of it, I haven't even got that excuse. <laughs> oh, well, I guess you're happy that your wife wasn't hurt in the accident this morning. The what? Oh, it wasn't serious. She just backed into my wife's car and crumpled your fender. Gracie Crumple, the fender? Yes. I always say that it takes a woman to be a woman driver. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you're so right. Well, goodbye, Mr. Postman. Goodbye, Mr. Murray. Remember, keep smiling. <laughs> Well, who was it, Speedy? The postman. Oh. Well, as I was saying, I think I'll get a fur coat, too. Maybe Red Fox. To, uh... Did you say the postman? That's right. Oh. He just, um, delivered the mail, huh? Ah! Oh, fine thing. So you and Bill try to put one over on me? Yes, dear. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Yes, dear. You take me for a complete idiot? Yes, dear. And that hat goes back to the store. It goes back? Yes. <laughs> All right, dear. If you say so. <laughs> oh, no, honey, don't cry. I can't stand to see you cry. You'll dry your tears, you can keep the hat. You really? Sure, honey. Now, why didn't I think of this method in the first place? I said, hey.
Horses Radio Service. This is Bill Goodwin, inviting all you servicemen and women to enjoy another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen, our tenor Jimmy Cash, and Felix Mills and his orchestra. And now, meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Well, George and Gracie have just arrived in New York on their barn tour, and we find them now waiting for a cab at Grand Central Station. Oh, my, it's grand to be in New York again. Wonderful, wonderful New York. No wonder they call it the city of brotherly love. You're thinking of Philadelphia. Oh. No wonder they call it the eternal city. That's Rome. The Windy City? Chicago. The Motor City? Detroit. Wonderful, wonderful New York. No wonder they call it New York City. Now you're playing it safe. Uh, I was born here, you know. You were here? Sure. I was born over on the east side. Pitt Street. Pitt Street. Yeah. 1842. 1842. What month? 1842 Pitt Street. Oh. Good night. I couldn't have been born in 1842. Oh, of course not. That's before Lincoln became president. <laughs> well, come on, let's grab a cab and find a place to stay. You know, Gracie, I'd I'd feel safer if you'd let me wire ahead for hotel reservations. Oh, don't be such a worrier, George. We'll have no trouble finding a place to stay in New York. And I know they have plenty of room in Brooklyn. Come on, Gracie, let's get a room. <laughs> Well, it's now uh, five hours and 76 hotels later, and George and Gracie are still looking. But, Clark, the man ahead of us got a room. He had a reservation. You see, Gracie, we should have wired for one yesterday. Yesterday? When he made his, people were only smoking their cigarettes halfway down. <laughs> well, hiya, Burns. Oh, hello, hello, Bill. Oh, hello, Goodwin. You know where we can get a hotel room? Are you kidding? George, you won't find a room in this town if you live to be a hundred. Which gives you about two months to look around. <laughs> Funny man. Uh, how did you get a room here? Well, I didn't, George. I'm staying with an aunt. I'm just here to see an old pal of mine, Francho Tone. Francho Tone? The movie star? Yeah. Does he stay here? Yes, we were out together last night. Went dancing at Roseland. <laughs> Isn't he a little tall for you to dance with? Gracie, we had dates. Oh. Bill, what sort of a fellow is Franchitone? Oh, he's suave, sophisticated, handsome, and the devil with the women. <laughs> Gee, they... they... <laughs> he's cute. They simply can't resist him. Ah. Oh. In other words, he's George's type. <laughs> What? <laughs> I get awfully silly sometimes, don't I? <laughs> all right, all right. Hey, Bill. Yes. There's Tone getting off the elevator right now. Yeah, where? Oh, oh, yes. Say, he is fascinating. That man of the world type that women like. He is, huh? Yes. And look at those young, firm bags under his eyes. <laughs> Hey, look, he's got a suitcase with him. It looks like he's checking out. Well, grab his room for us. Well, you wait here, kids. I'll talk to him. Hey, Francho, where are you going? Oh, hello, Bill. (laughs) 
France. You checking out? Oh, just going to Chicago for a couple of days. Say, Bill, where did those girls come from that we were out with last night? Oh, you mean Ingrid and Greta? Yeah. <laughs> Ingrid and Greta Bugelmeyer. Very, very high-class girls, Francio. I had plenty of trouble getting them. They only go out with celebrities, and that left one of us in a pretty embarrassing spot. Well, so long, Bill. I gotta run. Oh, wait, Francio. How about a couple of friends of mine using your room while you're gone? Gee, I'm sorry. I've already loaned it to a fellow. I'll see you later, Bill. Okay. So long, Francho. Well, how about it, Bill? Did you get Francho Tone's room for us? Well, no, Gracie. A friend of his has already moved in. It's too bad, too. It's one of the nicest rooms in the hotel. 516. 516, huh? Well, thanks for trying, Bill. I'll see you later. Bye, Gracie. Uh, George, get our bags and bring them up to room 516. Have we, uh, have we got it? We'll have it. <laughs> Is this the room Francho Tone just left? Yes. Well, I'm a nurse from the Board of Health. Take off your clothes. What? We have to burn them. This room is contaminated. Mr. Tone just collapsed in the lobby with a very contagious disease. Uh, what disease? Uh, what disease? Yes. Uh, double frizzola of the throat. Uh, frizzola? Uh, and you think I might get it? You may already have it. Stick out your tongue. Ah. Uh, now turn it over. I can't. Frizzola. Look, lady, I never heard of Frizzola. Well, here I am, Gracie. Is this the room? Uh, 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 yes, yes. Uh, put everything inside. Okay, I'll put the stuff in this bedroom. Who's that? Uh, that? Um, why, he's the only living man who ever recovered from Frizzola. Holy smoke. Does it leave you looking like that? Yes. <laughs> I'm getting out of here. Uh, who was that? Uh, uh, that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the only living man who ever recovered from Frizzola. <laughs> Jimmy Cash, our young tenor, sings for you the romantic ballad, Where Are You? I thought you cared about me Where are you? Where's my heart? Where is the dream we started? I can't believe we're parted Where are you? When we said goodbye, love What had we to gain? When I gave you my love, was it all in vain? All life through, must I go on pretending? Where is my happy ending? We're going to spend the night in Francho Tone's apartment. Stop moaning around and help me finish unpacking. Here, stick those handkerchiefs in the dresser drawer. All right. Oh, my goodness, Mr. Tone left some things behind. <laughs> what's, uh, what's funny? He wears pink ones. <laughs> Come on, honey. I'm, I'm tired. I want to get to bed. Well, I'm almost ready for bed, dear. Are my cosmetics in this bag? I don't know. Unpack it and find out. Oh, let's see now. Cold cream, vanishing cream, cleansing cream, night cream, chin strap and girdle. George, where'd you put my stuff? It's in the other bag, I guess. 
Oh, gee, Francis Tone's apartment. Mm, well, come on, come to bed, Jane. All right, dear. Uh, did you notice this leather-bound book on the nightstand beside the bed? No. Oh, I'll bet it's a book of poems that Francis Tone reads every night before he drops off. I'll read one. Okay, read it and let's go to sleep. Oh, now, here's one that starts, Gertie, Plaza 5, 9970. <laughs> well, George, that doesn't rhyme, does it? Gracie, if you don't stop snooping around and talking so much about Francho Tone, you'll dream about him tonight. Oh, I should dream about Francho Tone when I'm married to George Burns. Believe me, you've got plenty that he hasn't got. Okay, go to sleep. I can't now. I'll be awake all night trying to think what it is. Gracie, turn out the light and go to sleep. Yes, dear. Imagine me dreaming about Francher Tone. Oh, what a silly idea. The only man I could ever dream about is my husband, George Tone. I mean, <laughs> Francher Burns. Oh, good idea. Ah, good morning, my darling wife. Is breakfast ready? Why, yes. Yes, it is, George. Why are you staring at me, Gracie? Well, you you look so cute this morning. I do? Oh, yes. In fact, better than you did when I married you. Well, here's a nice big kiss for you, darling. Do that again, George. All right. You are George, aren't you? Of course, precious. To prove it, here's another great big kiss. George, do you have any identification on you? Why, what's come over you, Gracie? You've never been this way before. Oh, neither have you. Well, I'll have to be running the office, sweetheart. Give me a big hug. Oh, George, don't squeeze me so tight. George, oh, you're so strong. George, George. George, George. What? What? What's, what's the matter, Gracie? Oh, George, I just had a dream. Turn on the light. I want to look at you. Okay. Huh? Turn it off there. Go back to sleep, Gracie. Oh, now that's funny. I could have sworn that George looked like Francho Tone. Oh, I guess I'm just overtired. Oh. Yoo hoo, Gracie. I'm home. Oh, George, you're early tonight. Dinner isn't ready. Oh, that's all right, baby. <laughs> By the way, you know that new hat you've been wanting? Yes. I bought it for you today. And that reminds me, here's the check for last week's radio program. You keep it all. Me? Keep it all? Sure. And here's a kiss to seal the bargain. <laughs> well, why, why do you look so puzzled? I still say something new has been added. Well, aren't you happy? Happy? I'm delirious. Gracie. 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 Will you please tell me why you're sitting up in bed laughing in the middle of the night? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, dear. It's that dream again. I, I keep having dreams in which you look like Francho Tone. It's terrible. It is, huh? Yeah, they're so short. <laughs> Go to sleep, dear. Oh, yes, dear. Oh. Well, Gracie, I've got a surprise for you. You have, George? Yeah. Francho Tone is on his way over here. Oh, oh but George, he's a terrible wolf. Are you kidding? <laughs> Francho Tone a wolf? Well, he's almost as old as I am. But I tell you, dear, he's a handsome, sophisticated wolf. Huh. In his condition, he couldn't catch Little Red Riding Hood. George. Mrs. Byrne? Yes? I'm Francho Tone. You? You're the handsome, 
sophisticated wolf? I am. You must have spent the night in the trap. Come here, baby. How would you like to get in pictures? Just a tone. Just call me Franchi. Come here, baby. Oh, please, please. I'm happily married to George Burns. George Burns? That broken down excuse for a man? Come here, baby. No, no. Francho Tone, what are you doing with my wife? Just saying hello, Hollywood style. Get out of my house, you cad. Get out. I should have known better than to leave you alone. Wolf. Oh, George, what a horrible experience that was. He made advances. Well, don't even talk about it, darling. I'll take you in my arms and hug your fears away. Oh, George. You're so sweet. Oh, George. So beautiful. Oh, George. So, so precious. Oh, George. Oh, George. Oh, George. What? Uh, what's, what's the matter? Oh, George. Franco tune again. I told you you shouldn't have eaten that lobster at Lindy's. Well, do you think that's what's making me dream about Franco tone, the lobster? Sure. Now go to sleep. George. What? Do you think Lindy's would deliver at this time of night? Oh, good night. <laughs> Time now for Felix Mills and his orchestra. It's the always popular The Girlfriend. sleep a wink last night. Nice 
so you've hardly touched your breakfast. Oh, I can't eat, dear. I'm worried. Imagine dreaming all night about Francho Tone. Well, it's nothing to worry about. It's very simple. You sleep in Francho Tone's bed, so you dreamed about him. Well, that doesn't explain it. Why not? Oh, well, I slept in a Murphy bed, but I didn't dream about George Murphy. <laughs> That's silly. I took a nap on a Morris chair, but I didn't dream about Chester Morris. All right, all right. And I once slept in front of a stove, but I didn't dream about Gabriel Heater. <laughs> Just forget it, dear. No, I'm worried. It's embarrassing for a married woman to have this happen to her. It was just a dream. But I don't want to dream about men. I just want to dream about you. <laughs> Thanks, dear. Come in. Oh, hello, Bill. Gracie, say, how did you manage to get Francho Tone's apartment? Oh, I managed it, Bill, but I'm, I'm almost sorry I did. Why? Well, I dream all night long that George is Francho Tone. Well, you don't have to stay here during the day. <laughs> ah, yes, funny, uh, Billy Bill, I won't get any sympathy from you, I can see that Oh, sure you will, Gracie I know how upsetting dreams can be Gosh, I dreamed last night that Lana Turner, Paulette Goddard, and Betty Grable came to my hotel room And grabbed me and just started to kiss me and kiss me and kiss me It was horrible <laughs> worried about my dreams. I guess there's only way for me to, one way for me to stop dreaming about Francho Tone. What's that? Well, I'll have to stay awake. Well, okay. Bill and I'll go down and get you some black coffee. All right, dear. Well, I'm just going to sit down here and concentrate on staying awake. Should I dream about Francho Tone anyway? True, Francho Tone's got broad shoulders, but so has George got broad... Uh-huh. True, uh... <laughs> Francho Tone's got a, a big chest, but so has George got a... Oh, maybe I should start at the other end. <laughs> anyway, I won't dream about him anymore because I won't go to sleep. Well, hello. Well, what do you know? I did go to sleep. I beg your pardon? You got back sooner than I expected, darling. Well, I didn't go to Chicago yet. Darling? Did you call me Darling? Well, do you know of any reason why I shouldn't call you darling? Well, that's what bothers me. There's probably every reason why you should. <laughs> I should say so. I'm your wife. My what? Your wife. You... You mean you and I got married? Well, certainly. Oh, I knew I shouldn't have had that second martini last night. <laughs> Look, honey, which one of the Vogelmeyers are you? Vogelmeyer? Yeah, I'll start the annulment proceeding. You will not, not after I've been married to you for ten years. Ten... Ten years? Well, really, dear, you needn't act so surprised. Do you mind if I ask you a rather personal question? Oh, of course not. What is it? Do we have any children? Oh, well, now, this is getting pretty silly, even for a dream. I wish I knew what's come over you, George. George? My name isn't George, it's Francho. Francho Tone. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Yeah, but it is. <laughs> I'm Francho Tone. Look, you think you're Francho Tone, and I think you're Francho Tone, but you happen to be George Burns. And as soon as I wake up, you'll get your old face back. <laughs> look, look, lady, I'm, I'm a little confused. Well, Gracie, I got the call. Oh. Oh, come in. We were just talking about you, Francho. <laughs> Francho? No, Gracie. I'm George. He's Francho. Look, mister, can you tell me what's going on here? Oh, sure. It's very simple, Mr. Tone. You see, when my wife falls asleep, she dreams that you're me and I'm you. But when she's awake, I'm me and you're you. But right now, she thinks she's asleep, so I'm you and you're me. But actually, you're you and I'm me. <laughs> Which one of the Vogelmeyers did you marry like that? I know it sounds, con uh, it sounds confusing, but all we have to do is convince her that she's awake. You're awake, lady. Honest, you are wide awake. Really? Would you pinch me to make sure? Why, of course. Ouch. There you are. Oh, well, gee, you pinch kind of cute. I do, huh? Uh-huh. It's obvious. 
obvious that you're not my husband. Of course he isn't your husband, Gracie. Doesn't it come back to you now? You sent me out for black coffee to keep you awake, and here it is. Oh, yes, I remember now. When I'm awake, you're my husband. That's right. And when I'm asleep, you're my husband. That's right. George. Wow. You drink the coffee. I (laughs) shall. George and Gracie. Well, Gracie, next week we'll be selling bonds in Philadelphia, and the guest star will be one of the world's greatest pianists. Oh, George, you shouldn't think of me as the guest. Not you, Gracie. Jose Aturbe. You're, uh, you're hardly in his class. Well, according to Sir Albert Coates, the great conductor, I'm better than Aturbe. Coates thinks you're better? Well, certainly. We both played with Mr. Coates, and when I finished, he kissed me, and he didn't didn't kiss kiss Jose Jose Terby. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.
Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gracie Allen. Tonight, George and I and our guest, Frank Sinatra, are broadcasting from the Warner Brothers Theater in Hollywood. And everyone here bought a bond to get in. We wish all of you listening could be here, but since you can, we do ask you to buy an extra bond. You see, the sixth war loan is falling dangerously short in the sale of e-bonds. In other words, those sold to individuals, not companies. I don't have to tell you why to buy bonds. You know that the war costs millions of dollars a day, and we all know by now that it is far from being over. So all we can do is ask you to buy an extra bond. And we do ask you, remember that a war bond is the finest Christmas present you can possibly give. Right, Frankie? Right, George. And when you give a bond, you're also giving arms and ammunition to our boys overseas. <laughs> everyone, this is Bill Goodwin, speaking for Swan, the new white floating soap that's pure as fine Castiles. Well, it's Tuesday night again, time for another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen, and tonight their special guest, Frank Sinatra, with Felix Mills and his orchestra. And now, meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Well, George and Gracie are out canvassing the neighborhood selling war bonds, and their housekeeper, Mrs. Regan, is making the most of their absence. She's having a wonderful time listening to her latest Frank Sinatra record. My sweet embrace of all you. Ah, Frankie lad, through the voice of your fair melts the stays in me corset. <laughs> And to think I used to swoon over John McCormick. <laughs> well, we're back, Mrs. Reagan, and George sold more bonds than I did again. Yeah, I beat her again. Looks like I'm going to win the bet. Oh, you made a little wager, huh? Oh, yeah, you... We bet a wristwatch. If I sell more bonds than George, he has to go right down to the store and buy me a wristwatch. But if he sells more than I do, I have to wait till Christmas for it. <laughs> I wish Gracie would handle my transactions with Morgenthau. Well, I'd best get some lunch for you folks. Oh, by the way, Gracie, we have to be at Warner Brothers Theater for the bond show rehearsal at 5 o'clock. Yeah. You know, George, I'm glad it's Warner Brothers. I feel sort of sentimental about that theater. How come? Oh, I don't know. I guess it's the great love scenes we sat there and watched. <gasps> what passionate embraces. But done with such finesse. Yes, that's where to go to learn technique. Yes. Of course, it's not bad in the Pantages balcony, either. <laughs> I thought you meant the lovemaking on the screen. Oh, George, you're so naive. I'll bet you think the back seat of a taxi is just for transportation. <laughs> yeah, I'm a tourist. George, there's almost certain to be some big movie producers and directors in the audience tonight, and it's a perfect chance for you to be discovered. So be sure to slip in a song. I'd like that, huh? Oh, yes. Why, you might become the, the singing Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> you, uh, you think so? Sure. Y you know, George, you're a cross between Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> Humphrey Bogart and who else? Oh, please, dear, don't be a pig. <laughs> Well, it does look like tonight is my golden opportunity, all right. Any any other singers on the program? Not a one. You'll be outstanding. Ain't misbehaving all by myself. Oh, oh excuse me, dear. There's someone at the door. Good afternoon, Miss Evening. Oh, well, hello, Mr. Postman. Lovely day, isn't it? Oh, yes. The crisp winter air just turns my blood to wine and sends it racing through my magnificent body. Gosh, it's good to be alive. Oh, yes. I'm much happier that way, too. Are you coming to the Bond show at Warner Brothers Theater tonight? Oh, yes. My wife wouldn't miss Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra? Will he be there tonight? Yes. Oh, dear. Oh, I'd give anything to keep Mr. Sinatra from showing up tonight. Me, too. There's something about his singing that brings out the beast in my wife. Well, is, is that bad? 
Oh, yes. She can't afford to look any more like a beast than she does now. <laughs> well, let me know if I can help you. Goodbye, Missy Burns. Remember, keep smiling. <laughs> George, Judge, get a grip on yourself. Frank Sinatra is singing tonight. Well, of all the... Oh, well, now, now, don't get excited. You can sing some other time. But I wanted to sing tonight. I wanted to be discovered tonight. Oh, Pooh, let Sinatra sing tonight. You're young, you've got years and (laughs) years. You're right. Tonight's the night. (laughs) Well, I'm going down to the cigar store. Oh, poor George. Sensitive artist that he is. Mrs. Reagan! Well, I'll just have to see that Frank Sinatra doesn't show up tonight. Did you call me, Mrs. Burns? Oh, yes, Mrs. Reagan. I- I've got a problem, and maybe you can help me. You see, George wants to sing at the Bond show tonight, yes. but Frank Sinatra is going to sing there. Now, they can't both sing. Certainly not. So it's up to us to get rid of one of them. Right you are. And we know which one, don't we? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) We certainly do. Will you help me? (laughs) That I will, and gladly. And I know just how to do it. Oh, yeah, how? On me dresser, I've got a bottle of knockout drops. My goodness. Well, why do you keep such a thing on your dresser? Force of habit. I used to use it on me husband to keep him home nights. Now, we'll slip the little Lugan a a glass of the stuff. And he'll sleep peacefully through the whole performance. Oh, wonderful. I'll go right up and get it. It's the blue bottle. (laughs) This is going to be good. (laughs) Come in. Oh, hello, Mrs. Regan. Is... (laughs) What what are you laughing about? (laughs) Well, I was... I was just thinking about Mr. Burns. (laughs) Oh. Oh, well, let me join you. (laughs) You know, Mrs. Regan, it's too bad he isn't here. We could look at him and get hysterical, huh? <laughs> oh, Mr. Goodwin. Yes? I understand you're a personal friend of Frank Sinatra's. Oh, yes, that's right, Miss Regan. The girls really go for him, don't they? Oh, do they? Well, sir, you should have seen what happened last night. Oh. See, Frankie and I walked out of the Brown Derby together, and this mob of girls clustered around him yelling, Ooh, Frankie, Frankie, introduce us to Bill Goodwin. <laughs> They wanted to meet you? Well, sure, Mrs. Regan. You see, they knew I'd tell them about the wonderful swan contest. That, that closes this Friday, December 15th. You know, the first, first prize in the swan contest is $100 a month for life or $20,000 in cash. So I told the girls that all they had to do to try for that prize or any of the 500 other cash prizes was to suggest a first name for Mama Swan, that lovable white bird that appears in all swan ads. Then, in 25 words or less, complete this sentence. I like swan soap better because... But, uh, Mr. Goodwin, didn't the girls ask Frankie for anything? Oh, of course, Miss Regan. They said, hey, Frankie, how about a few bars of our favorite? And did he oblige them? Well, sure. Gave each one of them a bar of swan. Uh, <laughs> when will I learn? Wasn't that peachy cheeky of Frank, huh? He knew they had to send a swan wrapper along with their name for Mama Swan and their 25 words on why they liked swan. As a matter of fact, you can send as many names as you wish. As long as you send in a swan wrapper with each name, and of course you send it all to Swan, Box 32, New York 8, New York. Full rules from your dealer if you want them, but no entry blank is necessary. And by the way, be sure to include his name as well as yours with your entry. Oh, Mr. Gould, I won't find out anything about Frankie from you. So I'll just put on his record again and use my imagination. All right, Frankie boy, sing to me.
sorry, Mrs. Burns. This is Frank Sinatra's house. Oh, thank you, Mr. Postman. Now, if I can get him to drink this knockout medicine of Mrs. Regan, he won't be around to steal the show from George tonight. And my wife will be so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck, Mrs. Burns. Thank you. George may be a Nicky, but if Frankie drinks this me. Yes? Oh, well, uh, how do you do? I'm working my way through college, selling Dr. Regan's elixir. Wait a minute. You're Gracie Allen. You couldn't be working your way through college. Oh, well, that is a little unbelievable, isn't it? I'll start again. How do you do? I'm working my way through high school. <laughs> <laughs> Come in, Gracie. What's this all about? Well, uh, Mr. Sinatra, you're a very lucky man. This is the last bottle of Dr. Regan's magic elixir. Well, just what is Dr. Regan's elixir? Well, it's the only cure for which there is no disease. <laughs> but uh, what would I want with this stuff? Oh, uh, taken regularly, it will build any man into a mass of muscle. It works wonders. <laughs> Can you tell me any men that this has worked wonders on? Well, um, have you seen my husband, George Burns? Well, yes, I've seen him. Oh. Uh, recently? Uh-huh, recently. Oh. Well, he starts tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, if you get a glass, I'll pour you out a nice big glass full. Now, wait a minute, Gracie. What's the stuff made of? Oh, it's a secret formula. Uh, made by a secret electrical process handed down from father to son for a thousand years. Where did they get electricity a thousand years ago? Now, if you'll get a glass, why... Uh, Gracie, <laughs> You knocked me out. Well, believe me, I'm trying to. <laughs> Tell me, why are you selling this stuff? Um, uh, why? Well, yes. Why should Gracie Allen have to go from house to house selling patent medicine? Uh, why? Yes. I'm trying to think of a good logical reason. Well, if you get one before I do, let's share it. <laughs> Gracie, don't you know? Yes, yes, of course I know. Can't you see I'm just being flippant to hide my shame? What shame? No, no, no. Don't ask me to tell you. You're too fine, Frankie. Too young and innocent. Oh, I don't know. I'm not so innocent. I've read books. <laughs> I know how the bees carry pollen from flower to flower. You do? Yeah, I even tried it. And believe me, it's nothing to get excited about. <laughs> Now, come on, Gracie. Tell me why you're doing this. Well, it'll be quite a shock, Frankie. You'd uh, better drink this elixir first so you'll be strong enough to stand it. No, thanks. Uh, just a spoonful? Uh-uh. Lick the cork? No, Gracie. <laughs> first, I want to know why you're selling medicine. Mm, well, I hate to tell you the reason, Frankie. It, it's so ugly, so sordid. Oh, so it's George. Huh? Oh, oh, yes, yes. George forces me to do it. Don't you make enough money on the radio to satisfy oh, him? Oh, no. He's never satisfied. He wants money. More money. More and more. Always more. Oh, you don't know what it's like. Yes, I do. I've got agents. <laughs> oh, Frankie. Men are beasts. Don't ever marry one. Don't worry. So George forces you to do this work, huh? Yes, that's why you've got to buy this last bottle. If I don't sell it all, he'll... Yes? He... Well, he beats me. Oh, you poor kid. Why, when you say that, I feel like throwing my arms around you and kissing your fears away. He beats me. <laughs> well... Just leave that bottle with me, Gracie, and I'll see that he doesn't beat you again. Oh, well, then you'll take it? Thank you, Frankie, thank you. Now be sure and drink a glass full before the bond show tonight. Mrs. Regan, where's Gracie? Oh, she's probably out going from house to house selling more bonds. Yeah, I guess it kind of gripes her that I that I uh, I beat her today. Uh, I'll get it, Mrs. Regan. Thank you. Well, Frank Sinatra, come in, Frank. Gee, I'm glad to see you. You rat! <laughs> rat! You dog! 
dog? You scoundrel. Scoundrel? Look, think of your own words. <laughs> Frankie, what's the matter? You ought to be ashamed of yourself, George Burns, letting your pretty little wife go selling from house to house. Well, what's wrong with that? She's supporting a very worthy thing. That's your opinion, brother. <laughs> and if you ask me, it's about time she stopped supporting it. Frankie, what are you saying? Oh, you don't like it, huh? No, it's not nice. Well, then tell me one thing, George. Is it true that if she doesn't sell enough, you beat her? Well, I beat her today. <laughs> Come to think of it, I beat her yesterday, too. And, and unless she starts doing better, I'll probably beat her tomorrow. <laughs> well, that does it. I'm going to give you the licking you deserve. Frankie. Put up your hands. No, no, not over your eyes. <laughs> Look, I don't get it. You're mad because my wife sells buns? Buns? Does this bottle of elixir look like a bun? This is what she tried to sell me. Gracie tried to sell you a bottle of elixir? I don't understand. Well, you'd better ask her about it. I've got to get to a rehearsal. That woman does things that, that are absolutely insane. I found that out the day she married me. Yep, that's... <laughs> that's the day she proved it all right. See you later, George. Well, George, everything is all set. You're going to sing tonight. Now, get your hat and let's go to rehearsal. Not so fast. Frank Sinatra was just here. Well, that's nice. He, 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 uh, Frank Sinatra? Here? Yes. But he's supposed to be unconscious by now. He was not unconscious. Are you sure? With him, it's very hard to tell. <laughs> Gracie, why did you go to Frank Sinatra's house and try to sell him this bottle of Alexa? Uh, you want to know why, huh? Yes. Um, would you believe me if I said I never went there? No. Well, that narrows it down. Gracie, answer my question. All right, dear. This is a bottle of knockout medicine. I wanted Sinatra to take it so you could sing tonight. What? Well, I wanted those movie producers to see you and hear you and make you a big star in pictures. And you think that's the way to make me a star? To go to Frank Sinatra's house and give him knockout drops? Well, isn't it? Of course not. Give him the knockout drops at the theater. Oh, oh George, you're wonderful. Let's hurry. Frankie is rehearsing right now. With her high starch collar and her high top shoes and her hair piled high upon her head. She went to find a jolly hour on the trolley and found my heart instead. With my light brown derby and my bright green tie, I was quite the lonesomest of men. I started the end, so I counted the ten, then I counted the ten again. Clang, clang, clang went the trolley. Ding, ding, ding went the bell. Zing, zing, zing went my heartstrings. For the moment I saw her, I fell. Chug, chug, chug went the motor. Bump, bump went the brake. Thump, thump, thump went my heartstrings. When she smiled, I could feel a car shake. I tipped my hat and took a seat. I said I hoped I hadn't stepped upon her feet. I asked her name and lost my breath. She looked so lovely that it scared me half to death. Buzz, 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 buzz went the buzzer. Plop, plop, plop went the wheels. Stop, stop, stop went my heart straight. As she started to leave, I took hold of her sleeve with my hand. And as if it were planned, she stayed on with me. And it was grand just to stand with her hand holding mine to the end of the line. Um, 
Mrs. Regan, now's our chance to give you-know-who the knockout medicine. Yes, yes. Say, do you suppose this stuff is still potent? Well, it should be. It was made according to my husband's favorite recipe, 99% alcohol. <laughs> but, gee, it's awfully old. I wish we had somebody to try it out on. Hello, Gracie. Oh, my, what quick service. <laughs> huh? Say, what do you girls got in that bottle? Oh, no, Bill. You can't have any of this. Why? It's a secret Irish love potion that makes a man irresistible to women. Wait a minute. Gracie, you mean if I drink that, women can't resist me? That's right. How do you like that? Somebody's been slipping the stuff in my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bill, you mean you're irresistible now? Gracie, I got women sitting at home tearing their hair out, waiting for me to take them out. Well, why don't you take them out? Who wants to go out with bald-headed women? <laughs> Say, you know, maybe I could use some of that love potion. Well, here, Bill, help yourself. Thanks. I'll just take a little sip, Gracie. You see, those girls may be going out with me just so I'll tell them how to win $100 a month of life or $20,000 in cash. That's the first prize in Swan's big contest, the one that closes this Friday. And there are 500 other cash prizes. All you have to do to win is suggest a first name for Mama Swan, that lovable white bird that appears in all Swan ads. Then in 25 words or less, complete this sentence. I like Swan so better because... And I thought those girls loved me. Give me another shot of that love potion. Oh, wait, here you are, Bill. Thanks. <laughs> Well, sir, I'm beginning to feel pretty irresistible. <laughs> now, uh, where was I? You were telling us about the swan contest. The can swan test? Yeah, yeah, Bill, remember? You send your entry to swan, box 32, New York 8, New York. You can send as many names as you wish, as long as you send in a swan wrapper with each name. Oh. Well, you know, that sounds like a pretty good little old proposition to me. <laughs> Where, where did you kids hear about that? You told us, Mr. Goodwin. I did? You can get full rules from your dealer, and you should include his name as well as yours with your entry. Oh. And remember, the contest closes this week, December the 15th. December 15th? Oh, gee, I better hurry. Look at my watch. It's three minutes to October. Well, <laughs> so long, girls. Hmm. Well, the stuff is potent, all right. He's out cold. Now, if we can get just get that would-be singer to take some. Well, here, I I'll put the medicine in two bottles. One of us is bound to get him. Come in. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me for coming into your dress room like this just before the show, Frankie, but I thought you might want a glass of water. Well, it's nice of you, Gracie, but I really don't want any. Oh, you've got to want some. All singers drink water before they sing. I didn't know that. Oh, sure. Nelson Eddy drinks gallons of water. It, it keeps the crumbs of shortening bread from sticking in his throat. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, Gracie. This glass of water is purple. Oh. Oh, well, you see, this is Warner Brothers. Everything's in Technicolor. <laughs> Gracie, this looks like that tonic you were trying to sell me, Dr. Regan's elixir. But it is, Frankie. Won't you try some? It'll grow hair on your chest in three days. Oh, thanks. Well, give us six days, it'll grow you a chest. Well, I see the only way I can get rid of you is to drink this stuff. Now, isn't that a coincidence? It's the only way I can think of to get rid of you, too. Well, bottoms up. Hmm. Not bad. Now, I knew you'd like it. Now, lie down on the floor. Why should I lie on the floor? Don't argue. Just lie on the floor. No, I think I'll rehearse my song. Won't you tell me when we will meet again? <laughs> Sunday, Monday. <gasps> oh, poor boy. He fell right between Monday and Tuesday. Gracie, I, uh, I, I heard a body fall, so I figured you gave Sinatra the knockout rock. Oh, rocks. there he is, George. Out like a light. Now you can go out there and sing in his place. Yeah, I ought to sing pretty good tonight. I feel great. Mrs. Regan just gave me some wonderful Irish tonic. Oh, John! <laughs> Wait till you tell him. When we meet again, we will meet again. Sunday, Monday. 
Hmm. Oh, my goodness. That's becoming the lost weekend. <laughs> Mrs. Reagan! Mrs. Reagan! What is it, Mrs. Burns? Look! Saints preserve us, there's a sight for you. George Burns and Frank Sinatra stretched out side by side. Well, yeah. You can't tell whether this is Warner Brothers or Mayo Brothers. <laughs> show starting. They play the introduction. What do we do? Well, I don't, uh, well can, can you carry a tune? A little. Well, me too. On the downbeat, Mrs. Reagan. Won't you tell me where? Well, George and Grace, you'll be right back. Meanwhile, don't forget that the Big Swan Contest ends midnight on Friday of this week, December 15th. Naturally, I can't enter this contest myself. None of us on the show can. It wouldn't be fair. But if I were you, I wouldn't pass up this easy chance to win some real money. I'll give you the address again in case you've missed it. Send your name from Mama Swan and your sentence about Swan Soap, along with your deal wrapper, to Swan, Box 32, New York 8, New York. Swan, Box 32, New York 8, New York. Good luck. And now here are George and Gracie. Well, Gracie, tonight has taught me a lesson. I'll never try to sing again. Oh, Mama's little nightingale mustn't feel like that. Do our little feathered friends stop singing when they can't find a nest to lay eggs in? I don't care. But don't you see, darling? You're a bird that's lost. You'll sing again. You'll find your little nest. You'll lay eggs again. Good night, sir. <laughs> The makers of Swan, the new white floating soap, join George and Gracie in inviting you to tune in to your Columbia station next Tuesday, same time. Tonight's broadcast came to you from the stage of Warner Brothers Theater in Hollywood in the interest of the sixth war loan. Now remember, George Burns and Gracie Allen, CBS next Tuesday night. Now till next Tuesday, this is Bill Goodwin saying, well, I, Swan, how about you? <laughs> CBS, Columbia, broadcasting system. Ow! KNX, Columbia Square, Los Angeles. Well, hello. Come right in. Oh, George, we've got company, and they're all in uniform. <laughs> This is Bill Goodwin, inviting all you servicemen and women to enjoy another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen, our tenor Jimmy Cash, and Felix Mills and his orchestra. And now, meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Oh, I'll get it, dear. You finish your breakfast. Good morning, Mrs. Burns. <laughs> oh, good morning, Mr. Postman. Why, Mr. Postman, you look rather worn out. I have what is commonly called mailman bends. <laughs> or civil service crouch. Oh, you poor man. Oh, don't feel sorry for me. My wife and I know just how to cure it. You do? Yes. You see, my spine is really like a steel band. So my wife just puts her knee in the small of my back. And I straighten up with a terrific ping. Oh, goodness. That's quite a trick. Yes. Well, here's a special delivery letter for you. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh it's from our sponsor. Listen to this news, Mr. Postman. From now on, our radio program will be on the air Monday night. Is that good? Why, Monday is the night they do high-class drama, like Cecil B. DeMille's Radio Theater and Screen Guild. Say, maybe we'll be doing a dramatic show, too. If you do, remember me. I was quite a thespian in my school days. I was the vitamin flint heart of John Burroughs Junior High. <laughs> really? 
Yes? Would you like a piece of Serrano de Bergerac? Oh, no, thank you. I never eat pastry in the morning. <laughs> no, no, I mean the play. Listen to this. Oh, Roxanne, with love I tremble. I love you. I am smothered. I am mad. I love you. I am faint. It is too much. Oh. Oh, Mr. Postman, what pain, what suffering. Yes, my back is killing me. <laughs> well, good day unto thee. And remember, retain a pleasant aspect. <laughs> will be on Monday night. Oh, I knew they were going to change it. So it's Monday night, huh? Uh-huh. You know that's the night Suckle B. the Mill has his radio theater. So I think we ought to do drama, too. Drama? Oh, sure. I'll bet Mr. DeMille will be plenty worried when he hears us. Yeah, yeah. He'll tear out hair by the handful. Yeah, and I... <laughs> I pity the person he tears it from. <laughs> well, okay, don't worry. We're not going to do dramatics. Oh, but, George, think of the great stories we can do. The story of Mrs. Parkington, the story of Mrs. Miniver, the story of Maggie Ettinger. Maggie Ettinger? Yeah, that's my beauty operator, and does she know some stories? <laughs> Gracie, uh, you may as well drop this thing right now. I'm not a dramatic actor, and I'm not going in for drama. But, Darling, you have a great talent for acting. Oh, come on. Let me hear you recite something from Shakespeare. Oh, go. Oh, please, George. Let me hear you do to be or not to be. That is the question. I don't know it. Well, I'll help you. Now, come on. To be or not to be. That is the... Well? Question? Oh, you're wonderful. Oh. <laughs> oh, George, that's grand. Shakespeare must have had you in mind when he wrote Hamlet. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I guess so. Come in. Well, hi, Burnses. What's a good word? Hello, Bill. Oh, have you heard the news, Bill? Our program is moving to Monday night. No, oh, really? Oh, yes. And George and I are having an argument. I think that we ought to do serious stuff, the kind of thing that makes people cry. But George wants to tell jokes. Please give us your serious opinion. Do you think we should do drama? Well, yes, Gracie, I do. Frankly, I think you're very good. And the man with you is only great. Oh, Bill. I mean it, George. I've never heard a finer, richer, more resonant voice. Well, thank you, Bill. <laughs> so, Gracie, when you've picked out the play for next Monday, just call me and I'll be ready. So long. Well, you see, George, everyone thinks we should do drama. Sure. Just so they can do their stuff. Well, forget it. It's not for me. Oh, George, don't say that. True, you're a great comedian. Great as Jack Benny. But you're also a fine actor like Charles Lawton. Oh, Gracie. Well, you're a combination Charles Lawton and Jack Benny. 
It, it just so happens that your Lawton sticks out more than your penny. <laughs> Forget it. Well, folks, I brought you some more hot coffee. Oh, Mrs. Regan, you haven't heard the news. Yeah. Starting next week, Mr. Burns and I are changing our radio program to Monday night. Are you now? Uh-huh. Then Monday's going to be a busy day around here. We'll have to change our washing schedule. Well, yes, we will. Um, what day would you like to do it, Mr. Burns? <laughs> Never mind. You see, Mrs. Regan, I'd like to do a dramatic program, but I can't seem to convince my husband. Dramatic program is a fine idea. And I think you should do something like that excellent Irish play, The Informer. Never mind, Mrs. Regan. Just pour me some coffee. Coffee is a Joe Wanton. No, Danny, me boy. The jig is up, and there'll be no feeding of informers in this house. <laughs> Fly on you, and the black name you brought on the honor of Ireland. Keep the snivelling little wretch covered with that gun, me girl, while I go out and call for help. Help! 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 <laughs> You see what you got me into? Don't, don't move, Daddy, me boy. I've got you covered. Oh, no. <laughs> Jimmy Cash, our young tenor, sings for you a little on the lonely side. Jim? I'm a little on the lonely A little on the lonely side I keep thinking of you only And wishing you were by my side You know, my dear, when you're not here There's no one to romance with Oh, if I'm seen with someone else it's just someone to dance with Every letter that you send me I read a dozen times or more Any wonder that I love you more and more Oh, how I miss your tender kiss and long to hold you tight I'm a little on the lonely side And now that our radio program is moving to Monday night, George has simply got to do drama. He'd only be great, you know. You really think so? Oh, yes. He's an actor from the top of his head to the tip of his toes. Maybe. But it's that stuff in between you've got to worry about. <laughs> well, anyway, I've sent for a dramatic coach to come over and teach George a few things. Like what? Well, now, for example, I know Barrymore has great facial expressions. Yeah? She'll give him that. Mm -hmm. Herbert Marshall has great diction. Mm -hmm. She'll give him that. Van Johnson has great... No, she couldn't give him that. <laughs> oh, excuse me, Mrs. Regan. There she is. Mrs. Burns? Uh, yes? I am Elizabeth Stevens, the dramatic tutor. Oh, well, come right in. My husband will be here in a few minutes. He's the one I want you to toot. <laughs> oh, I see. Meanwhile, perhaps you'd like a sample of my ability. Yeah, well, all right. Now, here's my impression of a famous personality you're sure to recognize. Hello, Mother. Hello, Father. The color lilies are in bloom again. Such a lovely flower. Suitable for any occasion, really, it is. Oh, oh, that was wonderful. It sounded just like her. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, I shall recreate a very popular Academy Award winner. Mr. Skeffington, I hate you. I hate you for what you did to my brother. You, you beast. I never loved you, Mrs. Skeffington. I married you for your money. You fool. Oh, that was wonderful. Simply wonderful. Who was it? <laughs> that was Miss Davis. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. But I didn't know Joan was in that picture. <laughs> 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 uh, quiet. Um, 
suppose we talk about your husband. Oh, all right. I'm sure you'll have him ready for Shakespeare in no time. Of course, addiction isn't everything. In order to play such roles as Hamlet, a man needs a handsome physique. How would your husband look in tight? Oh, he'd be a dream in tight. He has simply gorgeous legs. Really? Oh, yes. But his legs are so beautiful, they're actually jealous of one another. <laughs> jealous? Yes. His, his knees won't come near each other. <laughs> As uh, Bill Goodwin once put it, his knobs are snobs. <laughs> well, I can hardly wait to see your husband in tight. However, first I shall concentrate on his speaking voice. I must teach him to project pear-shaped tones from his stomach. Oh, well, that'll be easy. He has a pear-shaped stomach. <laughs> Hello, dear. Oh, You've, uh, you've got company. Oh, uh, yes, yes. I, I, I'd like you to meet uh, Elizabeth Stevens. How do? How do? Please, not how do. You should say how do you do. Do. Nice and round. Project. Ooh. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for the tip, although I didn't ask for it. <laughs> no, no. You didn't ask for it. Ask. You're darn right I didn't. And what's more, where do you come off? George, come in the den a minute. Okay. Didn't ask. Ooh! What's the idea of that thing picking on the way I talk? Say, has she got something to do with that dramatic idea of yours? Uh, why, no, no, George. Who is she? Why, um, she's our new laundress. Laundress? Mm -hmm. She and I almost insulted her. She certainly sounds high class. Oh, she is. You see, the average laundress just does the clothes rough dry, but this woman went to a finishing school. <laughs> I, uh, I, I see. Graduated with honors. Magna cum laundry. <laughs> okay, I'll put up with anything for laundress. Well, I thought that would work. I mean, I knew you'd cooperate. Oh, excuse me, dear, Mrs. Reagan is calling. Now, remember, humor the laundress. Uh, don't worry. Gosh, a laundress of our own at last. Now I can get my long underwear washed without waiting until summer to get them back. <laughs> I'll take the underwear in and ask her. Uh, well, uh, Miss Stevens, my wife just told me all about you. Oh, splendid. I'm sure our association will be a happy one. Yeah, me too. Uh, I brought these out to show you. So? Oh, oh yes. Your wife said you look quite handsome in them. <laughs> she did? <laughs> Matter of fact, I do look a little like Errol Flynn in them. <laughs> Aren't they a little baggy? Yeah, but uh, they'll be better after they're washed. How about gi uh, giving them a try? Very well. Put them on. <laughs> Put them on? Well, certainly. I can't do anything until you've put them on. <laughs> I use the Stanislavski method, you know. Oh, uh... <laughs> I guess I'm more used to, to the Chinese hand method. many schools, but I'm sure mine will prove satisfactory. Now, put them on and I'll start to work on you. <laughs> will it take long to do the job? Uh, perhaps weeks. <laughs> weeks. Well, you seem surprised. I spent months on Gary Cooper. <laughs> well, his are much longer than mine. I beg your pardon. Oh, I'm not trying to tell you how to run your business, but what do I do while you're working on me? Just stand there? <laughs> of course not. You walk up and down and say, How now, brown cow? Browsing in the green grass. <laughs> uh, Miss Stevens, isn't there an easier way? <laughs> Oh, don't despair. When I'm finished, everyone in Hollywood will want to see you. Well, I wouldn't let them. <laughs> Let's not be modest. Well, look, 
how soon can I get back into my regular clothes? Well, not until we've found, uh, ironed out all the rough spots. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Please don't argue. Put them on now. Okay. How now, brown cow gazing in the green grass? This is the sun. <laughs> Felix Mills and his orchestra with We Hear the Very Thought of You. The very thought of you I might forget to do The little ordinary things that everyone ought to do I'm living in a kind of daydream I'm happy as a king and foolish though it may seem to me that everything, the mere idea of you, the longing here for you, you never know how slow the moments go till I'm near to you. I see your face in every flower, your eyes and stars above, it's just the thought of you. Burns getting along with a dramatic teacher. Shh. I didn't dare tell him she was a dramatic teacher. Oh. He, he thinks she's a laundress. That way she can still correct his speech and everything without him getting wise. <laughs> Mrs. Burns, <laughs> you've always managed to get around your husband. <laughs> yes, but it's getting to be quite a trip. <laughs> hey, Gracie, I'd like to have you explain well, something. Well, George, what are you doing in your long underwear? That's what I want to talk to you about. <laughs> that new laundress insisted I put them on before she'd wash them. Oh. Oh, I see. I feel silly. Well, you look very cute, doesn't he, Mrs. Reagan? Just like a big white bunny rabbit. <laughs> he does not look like a bunny rabbit. <laughs> does he? <laughs> Mrs. Reagan, stop laughing. George looks very handsome in his long underwear. Honestly, he does. <laughs> well, he does not stop it. He's very handsome. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. That's enough. Believe me, if we hadn't been trying for two years to get along with us, I wouldn't stand for this. Oh, gosh, someone's at the door. Oh, it's only Bill Goodwin. I saw him through the window. You see what he wants, George. Mrs. Reagan and I are busy in the kitchen. Come on, Mrs. Reagan. Just like a big white bunny rabbit. <laughs> Come in, Bill. I say, George, I was... <laughs> What's the idea of the long underwear? You've got a laundress who's as nutty as a fruitcake. <laughs> She insists on washing the underwear while I've got them on. <laughs> Holy smoke, no wonder you always look like you've been through the ringer. <laughs> Come on, I'll put on my robe and let's go in. Well, here I am. Oh, uh, this is Bill Goodwin. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Say, you're kind of cute to be doing this kind of work. <laughs> but then I guess you could say the same about me, huh? <laughs> uh, oh, are you... Uh... 
Well, I've done a few things of my own. Yes, just light things. Oh, where did you do them? At the Pasadena Playhouse? <laughs> No, on the back porch. Back porch? Oh, I would like very much to get you on a stage. Really? Yes. I'd like very much to get you on a back porch. Well, man, I am a dramatic teacher. What? Yes. Then why did you want me to put on the long underwear? I thought they were your tights. Well, sister, if those are tights, his skin is awful loose. <laughs> Wait a minute. Did my wife hire you to sell me on drama? Well, in a manner of speaking, that was the idea. Well, you're wasting your time. Goodbye. Very well. Is that your attitude? Going my way, Mr. Goodwin? Well, I would be, miss, if you weren't so high class. I kind of like a half chick. Well, come on, tall, dark, and sudsy. Let's cut a rug. <laughs> well, oil your hinges, Gate. I see you swinging. <laughs> Goodbye, two shoes, you square from Delaware. Yeah, so long. <laughs> Jimmy Cash comes to the microphone now to sing the new Cole Porter ballad, I Love You. Jimmy? I love you. I love you, echo the hills. I love you, the golden dawn agrees as once more she sees daffodils. It's spring again, and birds on the wing again. To sing again the old melody. I love you. That's the song of songs, and it all belongs to you and me. It's spring again, and birds on the wing again. To sing again the old melody. I love you. That's the song of song, and it all belongs to you and me. of mine. Gracie, come in here. When she makes up her mind to something, nothing in the world. Did you call me Spencer? Oh, I mean George. I keep thinking of you as Spencer Tracy now that we're going dramatic next Monday night. We're not going dramatic next Monday or any of the following Mondays. No? No, and another thing. I found out you lied to me about that laundry. Oh, oh, yes. Yes, I lied to you. But I won't do it again. I swear I won't. You were right. I was wrong. I've been a foolish, headstrong girl, but from now on I'll obey. I swear I will. Your slightest wish is my command. Don't hate me, George. Beat me, kill me, but don't stop loving me. Oh, oh don't stop loving me. <laughs> Gee, honey, you mean that? No, but with acting like that, we're crazy not to go dramatic. <laughs> Oh, fine. Now, Gracie, for the last time, just because our program will be on the air Monday night, if we don't have to make ourselves, the Cecil will be the Mills Radio Theater. But, darling, you mustn't be afraid of it. Things will be the same. You'll still take your bows, your applause, my salary. <laughs> Nothing doing. Oh, but, George, I want you to be famous. I, I want you to have stature and dignity. I, I, I don't like what people are saying. What are they saying? Oh, they're saying, look, there goes the husband of Gracie Allen, the comedian. I don't like that. Don't? No, I want him to say, look, there goes the husband of Gracie Allen, the actress. <laughs> There's no use talking, Gracie. I'm sticking to comedy, and I've got a great joke for next week. So I'll say to you, W.C. Fields fell down the steps last night with two quarts of liquor and didn't spill a drop. 
Then you say, how come? And I say, he had it in him. <laughs> uh, don't you get it? He had it in him. Oh, George Burns, that's the worst thing I heard in my whole life. You wouldn't dare do that on the radio. You better change the drama. Uh, excuse me, Mrs. Burns. Mr. Goodwin wants to speak to you on the telephone. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Regan. Now, don't go away, George. Uh, hello? Yes? Yeah. You what? You did? Oh, Bill, you're wonderful. Thank you. Goodbye. Oh, Mrs. Regan, yes? guess who Bill got for our program next Monday? Charles Boyer. Charles Boyer? Whoa! You said it. The French Barry Fitzgerald. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Now I can do drama with Charles Boyer. Oh, I'm so glad George refused to go dramatic. Gracie, I've been thinking this over. I've decided to give the drama a try. You have? Yes. Oh, but George, I, I have a wonderful joke for you next week. You say W.C. Fields fell down the steps last night with two quarts of liquor and didn't spill a drop, and I say, how come? And you say he had it in him. <laughs> this is very confusing. I don't understand. <laughs> This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.